So we have about 100 people on the line and I just, I just wanna ask if any one of you now has any questions uh, for us to address before we bring everyone else in. Uh, Fredros, I, I think when we chatted, you indicated that you would want probably Diane to cover also some basic stuff of what DNA and why it matters, uh, I mean, it to be uh, on, on top priority for analysis by sequencing and genomic analysis. Because some people might not be really aware of how DNA can be harnessed. And um, I, I suggested that Diana would be the best person to put it in a simple perspective so that everyone is on board. I, I, I think that, that that should be covered as well. From the basics of DNA, moving forward to sequence. Indeed. So, so we've prepared for that. And uh, we, we're going to start from there, actually. Um, it won't be a very basic, but it will. It's designed to at least help people who are malaria experts, but are not necessarily genetics experts. Yeah. I think that's all from my side. I just, Fredros, uh, someone's gonna monitor the chat and then uh, reflect those back to us, right? We don't have to separately monitor chat questions. Is that correct? Uh, can you ask again? What did he say? If people are putting questions into the chat, someone yes. is gathering those and will reflect them back to us. We don't need to specifically follow the chat and answer in the chat is my question or. Correct, don't, don't worry about that because it's yeah. uh, my colleague Shayla and myself. Great, thank you. And um, we're gonna be trying to monitor as, as much as possible. Um, it may happen that we miss one, but we also have a lot of experts on the on the call. So yeah. we hope that they will be engaging. Uh, and Shayla, please, if, if there's anything that I miss, you just bring it forth as well, and um, and then we can we can start, we can we can um, express this for our colleagues. So I'm gonna be sharing a um, slide now. Um, I believe you can see my slides. Yep. You can see my screen. Fred, can right. you send me the slide separately? Yes, I just did. I just did, I just sent you the final copy, final version. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so you have that as well. So, all right, so is it okay if I bring in everyone else? I think so. All right. And that probably means I should be on video as well. Good. There is 130 people waiting, so I will just say admit everybody. But I have to say thank you all so much for, you know, doing this, doing this for us. Um, a, a very good morning to everybody. And uh, welcome to the 24th edition of uh, the Ifakara Masterclasses. Uh, today, as you can see, we are very lucky to have um, our four experts join with us uh, to discuss the subject of uh, malaria molecular surveillance. Um, we advertise the masterclass as uh, Genomics Surveillance 101 uh, to imply that we will be doing a little bit of, of, of basic work here just to get everybody um, to a reasonable understanding to have the discussion and then we will go a lot more practical. Um, we will be having a discussion on uh, the applications of this um, of molecular surveillance on malaria 
you know, uh, with, with reference to malaria uh, control and for people who are working on elimination as well, we hope that this will be useful. So we ask everybody to keep their microphones muted, uh, keep your videos muted as well, except for our experts, our expert speakers. And if you have any question, we ask you to participate in the chat as always. Today, we will actively try to raise some of these questions for our experts to address um, as well. Again, I would like to thank um, um, Alistair Miles from Sanga Institute, uh, Diane Webb. Diane, I have to learn to pronounce the second name. <laughs> Worth. Okay. Well, yes. yes, it's like W O R T H, except it's not <laughs> it's spelled that way. <laughs> yes, Professor Dad is from uh, Harvard uh, Broad Institute, Harvard 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 uh, School of Public Health, or Harvard T H Chan School of Public Health. I think we have Sarah Volkman also from Harvard, and we have uh, Mara Laurinsek, also a very difficult name. Uh, but I think I got that correct. And Mara is from Sangha Institute as well. And then we have Deus Ishengoma. Deus is from NIMRI, the National Institute of Medical Research in Tanzania. So with me as always, my co-host, uh, Dr. Sheila Ogoma, uh, we will be uh, you know, hosting the discussion today. Welcome. We will be starting in approximately 30 seconds. As always, we have this showing live on our YouTube channel. So I'm going to request my colleagues from Ifakara to share the link uh, of the YouTube channel with the, the rest <coughs> on, on chat. For those who would like to, to watch this later, we'll do that. The class typically lasts 150 minutes and we appreciate those who stay up until the end. Uh, hopefully, uh, we are with you till that time, but we understand that usually, you know, towards the end, some people might get commitments and that's perfectly okay. But we designed this for 150 minutes, approximately. Shayla, any words before we start? Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, a big thank you to our panelists today. We are looking forward to learning more about genomic surveillance. Um, and I think without wasting time, let's get right into it. Okay. And... Access granted. Shall... So where do we begin? Uh, I think this is going to be very interesting. Uh, we, we, we're going to talk a lot about um, applications of this, as we said also earlier on, we're going to uh, start with some basics. Actually, I would like to, uh, first of all, I mean, talk directly to Diane. Um, Diane, it's been 20 years almost since we had the, the Human Genome uh, Project completed. Um, and I think the Anopheles Gambi genome came right soon after that. And the malaria the plasmodium falciparum genome came soon after that. Now those days, it was billions of dollars uh, to sequence these things. Today, uh, Alistair tells me they can sequence a full genome of a mosquito at 50 pounds, approximately. Yep. Now very briefly talk to us about this, you know, the, the brief history of this in the last 10 years. Um, what has happened? And, and what what is it that we should be excited about today? Great. Well, thanks, Fred Rose, and thanks to everyone for uh, the invitation to join. And I'm always happy to talk about this part of this sort of subject. Um, as Fred Rose said, you know, we have now had for the past twenty years the ability to read the unique DNA code of many organisms, uh, the human being the, among the most complex, but the mosquito also equally complex and plasmodium about a hundredfold less complex. But the fundamentals of um, the DNA or the genome of each organism remain the same. And that is uh, the code uh, in, 
the code that's uh, provided by the DNA provides the blueprint for the entire organism's uh, uh, existence. And each of these blueprints uh, is unique. The, the series of sequences, there are only four bases that make up the DNA, but they can be arranged in, in uh, an almost infinite number of different ways. And, and it is this which provides the ability to distinguish one organism from another. So it's very easy using DNA sequence to tell a human from a mosquito, from a parasite. But also within each type of organism, it's also possible to have very fine dis distinctions. And an example from today, which is on the front of many of our minds is for example, the coronavirus, where we know that uh, the basic sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 causing the COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, was determined relatively early on, uh, soon after the infection was identified. And sequencing of that genome um, uh, has provided information uh, which allows us to identify variants. And as many of you know, there is concern that these variants have different properties and tracking them through molecular surveillance has enabled public health researchers to understand both the risk of spread, but also the potential risk uh, of uh, e evasion of, for example, vaccines. So, so we can get down to distinguishing individual organisms using the DNA sequence. And I think that's very important as we keep this in mind as we think about the use cases in malaria, both focusing on the parasite and on the mosquito. Um, so I don't know, Fredros, if you want yeah. more detail or, or perhaps another. We, we're topic. gonna we're gonna we're gonna get um, a, a lot more details into that. I think. Yeah. Uh, again, just to clarify, the, the the kind of people we have on the line attending this include a lot of postgraduate students. We have some people working for the National Malaria Control Programs. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some people who've never worked with DNA before. So uh, this is why it's important for us to, to have these uh, initial clarifications. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually on that point, before we stop, I just want a quick clarification uh, mm -hmm. uh, that there is a, a slight difference between a DNA and an RNA. Yes. Right. That, that's right. And so DNA um, is uh, always, there are always two copies of, or of the DNA strand. The DNA strand has to be paired. Um, whereas RNA, uh, there's a, essentially a single copy of the, the strand of, of molecules. They differ in their chemical structure, okay? Um, but the principles are the same. And in the case of organisms such as humans and mosquitoes and parasites, it is the DNA which then encodes the RNA uh, and then RNA is, the, is used to make the protein building box. In the case of viruses, the example I was just using, many viruses in fact have RNA as their genome. Um, and so they've sort of skipped the DNA step. Um, but the principles remain the same. There's, there are ways, there are enzymes that can directly copy the DNA into the RNA. So by sequencing the DNA, you get the entire blueprint of uh, the organism. And uh, it is this organization or sequence of along the DNA strand, which encodes specific proteins or other uh, molecules that are involved in maintaining cells. So the important, I think for this concept and for the use cases here, our, our focus is really on um, using the DNA uh, in the case of the organisms we'll be talking about and decoding that DNA or identifying the sequence of the DNA. And there are several ways to do this, several practical ways. One is um, 
to be able to sequence the entire genome and assemble it as, uh, as, as a unit. Um, and as Fredro said, in the early days, back in the early 2000s, late 1990s, this was a multi-lab, multi-million dollar process for each of the organisms. However, mm -hmm. technology has dramatically changed. And now, um, probably at the extreme, is a, is a DNA sequencing machine that's kind of the size of a thumb drive and uh, can be run from a small laptop computer or, or perhaps even a cell phone. Um, so and, that- and we, will, we, will, we, will, uh, we will get the, I have, I have yeah. actually some, um, <clears throat> Michelle and myself have made some, some slides for that specific yeah. one. So if you just hold okay. your thoughts on that and okay. then we can drive it, we can drive it uh, a little, a little uh, 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 back to the, you know, you were talking about use cases, and I just want to remind our audience again that the the DNA work or the genomics work or the molecular biology work that we will be discussing today is largely uh, in relation to the work going on around the world uh, for malaria control and elimination. And for our experts, just for your information, a lot of this work is built around uh, the technical documentation we have from the World Health Organization. And I believe that many of you participated in this specific meeting that mm -hmm. looked at potential applications of genomic surveillance in high transmission settings through to um, areas with uh, zero transmission or very low transmission. So we will be covering that entire cascade mm -hmm. uh, uh, going forward. So I just wanted to make, to make that clarification and then um, we, we proceed from there. So Dan, you were talking about sequencing. So you have your gene, you have your DNA, right? You try, you have to read the base pairs. You have to read the bases, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, talk, talk to us briefly about this. Yeah. Right. So, so the technology involves being able to read the code. Right, and yeah. the the sequence of the A's, T's, C's, and G's um, are the the critical piece of information, and there are various technologies to be able to do that. But important underlying this is in fact reading the code, and this requires uh, breaking the genome into smaller pieces. Um, it requ requires uh, for almost all technologies, uh, a, a technique that kind of was breakthrough in being able to sequence genomes, particularly from things like clinical samples or, or single mosquitoes. And that is a, a, a way in the test tube that we can amplify uh, a sequence of DNA. Uh, and so, if there's, you know, in the, in the best case, if there's one copy, we are able to amplify it in the test tube, create many copies, so we're then able to, to read those copies. And that was a breakthrough technology and, yeah. and one that uh, won the Nobel Prize, but also has, has really changed our ability to read sequence. And as uh, in the early days of DNA sequencing, uh, the, tech, the technology was very complicated and cumbersome and slow. Uh, when I started in the field, the sequence of a plasmid, which was around 3,000 base pairs, was, was, was the subject of someone's thesis defense, entire thesis defense. Now, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of base pairs are sequenced a day, and, you know, um, a, a single person can sequence uh, millions of bases. So, so the that's technology right. has really changed, and that's changed how we can answer questions. So, so when you when you when you break this chain in, into small pieces, mm -hmm. uh, your work in the lab kind of ends. Uh, it, everything then transforms into a computer. And right. uh, you know, I, I I had a chat with Alistair a few months ago, and I discovered that he never trained as a molecular biologist. Uh, uh, that it was a computer, uh, you know, 
uh, right. scientist from the beginning. Uh, and today he is one of our best molecular biologists in the mosquito side. So you would now transform this thing into a computer code and this is all you have, right? That's right. And, you know, uh, maybe Alistair wants to comment on this or, or some of the others on the call. I think that one of the other features of this technology is, as Fredros has just said, once the sequencing is done, uh, the, the next challenge is really the analysis of that sequencing. And that's again, something that has dramatically changed in the past decade. Uh, the development of faster computers, new methods to compare sequences and to do it rapidly. So the first step is we all always have a reference genome um, that allows us to compare the, the newly sequenced sample with the reference and look for differences. And the first step is aligning so we can compare, and that's a complicated, uh, uh, it, it requires uh, a significant computation, but that's now reached the stage of automation. And then uh, one identifies the differences between the reference sequence and the sample being sequenced. And I'll give a specific example in the case of malaria, where uh, we'll, we'll come back to this in a use case, but I think it's very important to keep in mind that there, are, when we talk about markers or differences in sequence, what we mean is when we compare the sequence of the reference with the sample, we're looking for differences. And, and in the case of drug resistance in malaria or in many other organisms, in fact, this is almost, almost associated with a single change in a single gene at a single base pair position. And we have the resolution to be able to detect that with this technology. So when I refer to something as a drug resistance marker, I mean that the specific base uh, in a specific gene, so the specific piece of code in that gene has changed in one position. And that's created, that's allowed the organism to go from being susceptible to a drug to resistance to a drug. It's somewhat more complicated than that. There are sometimes more than one change required, but the concept is that, that a single change in the coding sequence of the DNA can have yeah. a fantastic <clears throat> change in the outcome. And this yeah. is one of the things that molecular surveillance can detect and follow. And, and when you say a single code, you mean a single letter in the a image. A single area. letter, right, right, changes. Cool. So uh, let, let's move this uh, uh, forward and just bring it back again to, to the reason that we, we're interested in this. Today, some of the major uses or applications of um, uh, this type of molecular biology uh, for malaria control and elimination include the items listed on the on the slide here. And I guess at this point, I'm gonna to shift to Alistair and just ask uh, very briefly if there's any use case that is missing on that list uh, or any of the other uh, you know, um, experts, if there's any use case that we've left out uh, that we should add, or if this is at least reasonably good for the discussion today. I think it's certainly good enough for today, yes. I think each one of those you can break down into different components, but uh, I think that's a great overview. Okay, okay, brilliant. Uh, for colleagues asking about slides and all that, yes, definitely, uh, uh, we can arrange that as, as we continue. And if someone is facing challenge with like hearing or voice, just send a, a text message and we'll sort that out. Shayla, please. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, so Professor Diane, um, out of these applications um, for genomic surveillance, when you look at the diagnostics of malaria, the drugs, as well as the malaria vaccine and insecticides, out of this, which one is your most exciting use of genomic surveillance? Ooh, which one do you find the most exciting? That's a great question. So, I mean, I, I think the, 
the obvious immediate application is surveillance of drug resistance. And I think we're seeing that uh, now with the beginning hints that we're going, that there's at least artemisinin in delayed clearance appearing de novo in Africa, that's gonna be extremely important. So, so I'd say that's, that's the most obvious. Um, the, the, the second place that I, I find exciting, okay, is actually using genomic surveillance to understand the transmission dynamics of, um, of the parasite and how parasites are connected uh, across sites and beginning to understand, because remember that, you know, breaking down malaria transmission as a biologist means that essentially you're just measuring it. Every time the parasite goes into the mosquito, you're measuring two parasites coming together, exchanging DNA in a, in a recombinatorial matter. So there's fertilization, genetic, you know, genetic exchange, recombination and reassortment, and then <clears throat> uh, reduction back to single parasites uh, as you get into the oocyst. And so actually using that fundamental biological knowledge, one can think about transmission um, at, using those tools. And so I find that very exciting. That's still, we're still very early in understanding the ramifications and the interpretation of that. The other applications that we're, we're just beginning to use uh, are, are following, for example, vaccines and vaccine efficacy, um, particularly with many of the vaccine candidates, including the, the CSP protein, which is the, the target of the RTSS vaccine, we know that there are different alleles or different versions of the same gene that exist in different parasites. Um, and those sequences are different. And we're interested, as I gave the example with SARS-CoV-2, a perhaps simpler, uh, example right in the front of our mind, whether or not vaccines will be efficacious against all variants. And the same thing is, is a question in the case of the malaria vaccines, both the, the current vaccine and vaccines that will be developed in the future. The other space that I think um, DNA technology is going to be extremely useful is in the elimination setting. We are able using uh, DNA sequence technology to define the geographic origin of parasites based on the diversification of parasite populations. So one can distinguish parasites from Africa versus Asia versus South America very easily. So in elimination settings where importation is an issue, um, the technology should be extremely useful. In addition, as I've mentioned, there's very, can be very fine differences, very small differences can define populations. And so applications for uh, this technology looking uh, across borders um, and within regions, I think is also going to be extremely valuable. And that work is of course requiring additional research and additional data but I see um, really enormous opportunities in essentially defining the connectivity of parasites, be it across borders or within a country uh, across geographic regions. And, and we are in this, you know, all of us in the field are, are looking at that as kind of the next frontier. So, as, as I move forward, I'm extremely excited and I'm particularly excited that there are now many groups that will be using this technology to understand parasite biology, but also to translate that knowledge for use with national malaria control programs. And that part I think is for those of us who are fundamental researchers, uh, that translation is also a new frontier and one that I think we are is, is an iterative process. Certainly uh, many groups have begun and 
uh, but I, I think this is a space where dialogue about um, what the data means and how to use the data and where there's value added uh, is going to be extremely important. Thank you, Professor. Back to you, Fred. Yeah. Um... Dan and um, Sarah, Mara, Alste, and Deus, I know that molecular biology excites all of you very much, but I just want to get a little confirmation here, uh, also for the benefit of my colleagues here. You are not suggesting that molecular surveillance of malaria can replace some of the things that we have done traditionally. Rather, it should be complementary. Is, is that right thing to say? I, I, it should be complementary uh, and, and it should be, uh, it should provide added value, right? There's added information in having genomic data. I, I think there will be circumstances, for example, the surveillance of drug resistance really cannot be effectively done um, uh, in any other way. Um, one could do small therapeutic efficacy studies, but those are, you know, can only be done, you know, occasionally, uh, relatively speaking, whereas uh, drug resistance marker surveillance can be continuous and across a, as many samples as you need to analyze. So I think that's a way to think about it. It's where additional information is needed. Similarly, um, you know, parasite prevalence is often used as an indicator of transmission. However, prevalence can be due to clonal expansion of a very small population that is an outbreak, or it can represent um, diverse genomes or diverse parasites undergoing, um, <clears throat> undergoing um, kind of regular exchange of genetic information. And yeah. that implies different epidemiology, yet the overall measurement of prevalence, for example, might be the same, but the underlying actual epidemiology is different. And ge the genomics can differentiate that. And, and where that will be important, I, I can't a priori say, but I think having that information available to NMCP may drive different decisions in how yeah. to approach the distribution of the limited resources we have or they have to deal with, with malaria control with a focus toward moving toward elimination. No, th thanks for that. Cause I mean, obviously um, uh, some of the advantages uh, that molecular biology brings or genomics bring uh, can occasionally be too attractive for our young people. Uh, uh, people start to be, to run away from field epidemiology or entomology or that uh, laboratory microscopy, for example, or uh, to just go do gene sequencing. But you need to collect some data, some samples. Right. Uh, and this thing should be complementary, so. Yeah, is, yeah. And, and I would say, you know, one of the exciting things about the field, you know, from a technical standpoint is, the, the, you know, the generation of the sequence and the analytical pieces are becoming much more routine as a set of tools often automated. So that now the important questions actually go back to epidemiology and study design. And I, I think that that's very important to keep in mind. Sequencing parasites or, or mosquitoes for the sake of sequencing parasites or mosquitoes is, you know, is interesting and has a fundamental knowledge interest. But the important questions are how to relate that to what's going on in the field and, and how that informs better decisions. Um, and, and another, you know, sort of, I've, I've sort of, uh, because I myself spend most of my time working on parasites and parasite genomes, I've focused my comments on that, but, and, and, Alistair and, and um, uh, is, uh, we have insect uh, biologists on the line, insect molecular biologists. And I think it, it is important to recognize that many things that I've said ab about the parasite also apply to the, the mosquito and the analysis of mosquitoes. And there obviously 
the, the a major interest is in insecticide resistance. And I'm sure we're going to get to that. Not, I don't yeah. diminish that in its value and, and in many ways may have more immediate use case value. Um, but just to say that my own bias, because I've worked my entire career on the parasite, is yeah. looking at the parasite. Thank you, thank you, Dad. Thank you so much for all this intro. We're gonna let you rest for a few minutes okay. uh, and we wanna pick this up uh, with uh, uh, Alistair. So Alistair, who, uh, Dan was talking about sequencing, different methods of sequencing. You work at the Wellcome Trust Sangha Institute and originally doing Sangha sequencing. Uh, this is not the case anymore. You retain the name, but you don't do the same thing. We have a slide here describing different types of sequencing. And brief description for our participants, please. Um, well, the three main types of sequencing that we uh, can do at the Sanger Institute currently are uh, Illumina sequencing, um, uh, PAC bio sequencing, and Oxford nanopore sequencing. Um, and I actually might pass the ball to Mara at some point here because I think Mara is a little bit close to the sequencing technology yeah. than I am. Please. So she, uh, Mara, please. Yeah. Uh, what, what I'm, yeah, why don't I pass the ball? Yeah. Just a brief description of the different options. And this slide might be erroneous in a way. You, I mean, it's up, you feel free to change it, but if it's correct, just you can use it to just help explain uh, what the different sequencing methods are. I think um, I would agree with Alistair that the primary technologies that we're using now are those three, basically those, th those three companies and the, and the platforms they provide. Um, and a big difference in how they operate. So at some, at some level, they're all kind of basically looking at molecules with, with incredibly fancy cameras and, and counting and ordering the A's, C's, T's, and G's and reporting that back to a computer. The big difference in how they do that is so technical, I can't get into it. <laughs> I wouldn't even be able to do a good job of it. But I think the important things for this genomic surveillance topic is almost about the size of the pieces you're looking at. So if we think of the genome, I mean, I'll just give a super simplistic example of, if we think of this genome as a, as a page with some sentences written on it, and that, and that has a message. You read that page and you can understand the content of it, the words, the sentences, the paragraphs, and the meaning. Um, what organisms are trying to do is, is, is kind of copy that in their, rep, in their replication, right? But they're not like Xerox machines, they're like typists, so they make mistakes all the time. So mutations, that's what mutations are. It's just a, a simple mistake in the copying of the code. So if I give a really simplistic example, you could have a sentence that says, the mosquito is resting. And if you want to sequence that with Illumina, you're gonna sequence each word individually. You're gonna get the, you're gonna get C, uh, mus, mus, you're gonna get keto, <laughs> you're gonna get pieces of this sentence in really small bits. And you're gonna have to get a lot of them in order to put them in the right order. So it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, really. If you're right. using PacBio, you're getting bigger pieces. Um, so you're getting like the mosquito. And the same thing is true for ONT. With ONT, you can even get bigger pieces. You can get the mosquito is. And what we are trying to do with all the sequencing is basically get as accurate as we can. And again, it depends on, I think there's kind of three purposes for sequencing in this field of genomic surveillance. One is, what is, what is it? Something simple. And that's like the single mutation, the single barcode, the single just a kind of uh, a marker of, you just need to know, okay, I just sequenced the mosquito. Okay, I know this, this is a mosquito. <laughs> I didn't get is, I didn't get resting. I just went for a mosquito. I knew yeah. where it sits and that's what I pulled out. And now I know what it is. And if you um, want to know more about movement of individual organisms through time and space, you might want to look at much more than just mosquito. You might want to look at the whole sentence. And if you're in the business of actually trying to get the best job done you can, then you might wanna be creating a new reference genome and you might wanna get that whole thing perfect so that you have the background, the scaffold to kind of put the little letters and the words back together in the right order through larger scale sequencing. And that's a lot of what we do with mosquitoes at Sanger's. We've got our reference okay. genome and we sequence tons of individuals and we kind of align them. We put them in that order of the mosquito is resting and we try to figure out what, <laughs> what is, what do each of those individuals look like? And sometimes you'll see a mosquito that says the mosquito is resistant. And so that is a mutation and you can detect that organism has 
you know, has a change that really changes the fundamental biology of that mosquito in terms of how we really, what we need to know about it. Right. So hopefully that helps. It's, it's sort of, I think really those, all three platforms are really important right now. The advantage of Oxford Nanopore, I think, is that it's very portable, but it's still really noisy. So the data that you get out is going to have all sorts of typos in it, and you're going to have to figure out whether those are typos or real mutations. Whereas yeah. with Illumina and PacBio, the quality, you, you're, you get a lot more confidence that you've got the right sentence structure. No, thanks. And, and to, to our audience on the, on the line, uh, don't get bored if you are already an expert in this. We, we're almost done with the basics, <laughs> and then we'll start doing some practicals. But Mara, every time I go into our lab in Ifakara, uh, uh, and you, you, you talk to these guys about sequencing, they, they like to use the word next generation sequence. These people just, these molecular biologists, you know, they just throw this phrase out there, next generation sequence. Uh, and then I'm lost, because um, I just know sequencing, you know. And, uh, but I watched a few videos here, and I, in, in the days they were doing the Human Genome Project, you had this Craig Venter guy with a shotgun, you know, you blast uh, your DNA, it scatters into tiny pieces, you try and match them, you get your entire sequence. Um, uh, something similar to Sangha, but now you have this, you know, advanced machines that do this much more rapidly and at much lower cost. Um, uh, so I, I think that's, that's, that's a, a great start, but I want to, Go back to Alistair briefly. Alistair, please don't mind. I remember a conversation I had with you in Nairobi once, and and, and you described a, a very different version of this story. You talked about amplicon sequencing and whole genome sequence. You, know, you, you use these words, amplicon, and then the you know, whole genome. You know what is what are these? So whole, whole genome sequencing is just that you take the DNA all of the DNA that you can get from an organism and you try and sequence all of it. Um, and uh, you can do that with Illumina or with uh, Oxford Nanopore or with PacBio, you can do that with any technology. You're just taking all of the DNA and you're trying to sequence as much of it as you can. Um, uh, with Amplicon sequencing, you, uh, before you sequence, you do a reaction which selects just specific parts of the genome that you know about. So you may know beforehand that you're interested in a particular gene. You might be looking at a particular gene that you know is involved in drug or insecticide resistance. And so you design a pair of primers which select and amplify up just that relatively short region of the genome, say 500 base pairs or something like that. And uh, so what you can do now with amplicon sequencing technology is you can actually mix uh, primers for say 60 or 70 parts of the genome that you're interested in. And you can put all of those primers together and you can amplify them all up together. And then you can run them on a sequencing machine together and then pull them out again. And uh, the obvious advantage of Amplicon sequencing uh, is that you it, it's much, much cheaper per uh, individual mosquito or parasite sample that you're sequencing because you're not actually sequencing very much DNA. So you can put, you know, a hundred different amplicons and maybe a, a thousand samples together in the same sequencing run and uh, get data out for all of those, those things. So, so you get this ability to scale, um, but obviously you can't see anything that you weren't looking for, if you see what I mean. So you have to have an idea of what you're looking for beforehand. Um, yeah. But what can happen in the case of drug and insecticide resistance uh, is that new genes that you didn't know about before suddenly become important. And that's particularly an issue, for example, if you're introducing a new drug or insecticide, you may get evolution happening at a gene that you were not expecting, didn't even know was involved in resistance or could be involved in resistance. And you won't see that unless you try and sequence the whole genome. But obviously when you've got when you've got an organism, particularly like an, an Anopheles mosquito, the whole genome is 200 million letters long. So that's why it costs more per mosquito to sequence because you have to sequence all of those 200 million letters. So that's why from a cost point of view, sequencing one mosquito now for the whole genome costs about 50 pounds. But sequencing, doing amplicon sequencing for a panel of say 70 amplicons for one mosquito costs us 
uh, maybe a, a tenth of that or less. Yeah, this is a this is a, a difficult to grasp sometime. But if you imagine that in the days of the Human Genome Project, it was a multi-billion-dollar initiative, and now you're talking fifty pounds. Uh, this is probably one area of science where advancements have been truly accelerated. Um, so uh, thanks to everybody working on this space. Back to you, Shayla. Oh, thank you, Fred. Um, Dr. Sarah, so using this slide, um, could you please briefly explain to us what um, single nucleotide polymorphism genotyping is? Just briefly what the process looks like or what it takes. Sure. sure, so single nucleotide polymorphism sometimes gets called SNP. So you'll hear the term SNPs and they are single nucleotide exchanges as are visualized here. So when you do a pairwise comparison, so you look between two genomes, you can see that everything will align at that locus, except for at the highlighted yellow areas these are single nucleotide changes. And depending upon where they are, they may have impact on phenotype or expression characteristics, such as we've been talking about for drug or insecticide resistance. But they also are very useful as markers. Um, almost think about it like fingerprinting your parasite or your vector. Um, you're actually looking for patterns as we've been talking about so sometimes we use these single nucleotide polymorphism changes as markers or indicators of a particular parasite type or a drug resistance phenotype. And so that's how we sort of use these SNPs, but they're positions across the genome that vary between two individuals. And again, compared to a reference or compared between two individuals in a population. Yeah, thanks Sarah. So is this supposed to be easier to do, like not very technical compared to the other ones? So as we were just talking about, um, when we look at whole genome sequence or amplicon sequencing, from there you can identify the single nucleotide polymorphisms. You can also use other strategies that specifically look for only a few known single nucleotide polymorphisms. So there are different techniques that are just focused on for example, a drug resistance locus or a drug resistance SNP. So the idea of a single nucleotide polymorphism um, reflects this pairwise change. You can get that from whole genome sequence or amplicon sequence, but you can also get it through maybe more simple or directed um, genotyping technologies. People may be familiar with things like TACMAN or other kinds of technologies. So it depends on your question, what it is that you want to find and what you're looking for. Um, when we look for SNPs that are um, indicators, for example, of drug resistance, knowing which ones we're looking for, we may only have to focus on those resistant loci, not necessarily the whole genome. Although theoretically, if you sequence the whole genome, those SNPs are in there. You just then need to use your computational tools to find them. So. I think what you're getting at is this idea of using simple genotyping technologies, uh, sometimes called barcodes, and there are a number of different barcode type technologies that only sample a subset of maybe 25 or 100 markers in the genome compared to the whole genome sequence for the parasite, for example, might be, you know, you might be looking at 150,000 SNPs in a whole genome comparison. Whereas maybe in a molecular type barcode tool, you might be looking at 25 or 100 of these. And depending upon your question, these 25 or 100 may be very informative about your population or your drug resistance locus. So again, it will depend on your question, what you're looking for, but there is great value in um, smaller information, um, either SNPs or from Amplicons looking at those SNPs associated together, maybe in what we call a haplotype when they come from the same region of the genome. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Fred? SNP is a good word. <laughs> Fun word. Fun word. Don't forget SNP. <laughs> Amplicon, haplotype. You guys are starting to confuse us, but let's, 
let's let's hope we stay together. Uh, this slide should have come earlier. I think when we were talking about you know sequencing different fragments, you try to align them, uh, and slowly you do that until you have your entire gene. Is that right, Sarah? Yeah. Basically, um, again, depending, you know, when we talk about whole genome sequence, we're talking about usually, as Alistair said, the whole of the genome. When you talk about an amplicon, you're talking about a purposeful region of the genome that you've usually PCR amplified. So that might be something, polymerase chain reaction, a specific section. It might be 100 base pairs in length. And you look at the information in that region, that then creates what we call a haplotype. When you're looking for a SNP, you're looking for a single position. Again, you might have found that in the whole genome or the amplicon, or just by a more directed approach where you look just for the SNP. So let's try to get the vocabulary a little bit clear. But we align all these sequences, and then we look for the information we're asking. Maybe a SNP, maybe a set of SNPs. And again, when they come together in the genome, we often call that a haplotype because that gives us more information about the inf that that region of the DNA. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Sheila, back to you. Um, yeah, we are learning a lot here, um, Fred, um, especially with the with the with the using the right term. So, um, Professor Dios Ishengoma, um, this is for you. So, is it really necessary mm -hmm. for national malaria programs or research institutes to collect baseline information on genomics, say for the parasites or for the mosquitoes? Because from the talks that we've had, um, it looks like we are looking for these changes in resistance. Uh, we are looking for the changes in the way the DNAs, the codes align themselves. So is it necessary to have baseline information just in case we have changes in the future? Yeah, Abdul. Uh, hello. 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 No, we can hear you. Yes. Yes. We can hear you. yes. I'm sorry about the internet problem. And and basically, before I even get into my question, this is one of the issues which uh, for us in the developing countries need to get sorted out because we are working in an environment which many people cannot appreciate. As I joined one hour ago, I've been disconnected more than five times and it's because my internet is not Sorry. stable. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah, so baseline information is absolutely essential because quite often uh, this kind of analysis or this uh, kind of, that kind of the, the information from genomics and molecular analysis uh, gets richer if you are able to make a comparison. Like this is where we were and this is where we are now. For example, uh, Diane talked about expansion of the parasites. So if you are talking about prevalence and you're in an area uh, in the prevalence, for example, in Tanzania, it's now at around 7% overall. And in some areas, it's below zero. So if you're in that area where it's below zero, you know it's below zero now. And it happens that once just, in the blues, it gets five percent. So what would have happened if you didn't know it was it was below zero? You can't be able to say any, make an inference. So if you want to extract more information, that's useful. And I'm speaking from the uh, the national malaria control programs perspective. You need to have that kind of information so that if you are trying to measure the trend to assess the impact, you have a benchmark where you can refer that this is how it was and this is where we are now. It's very yeah. essential. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Professor. And uh, another question that is related to us, to this, sorry, from the chat box, is how feasible is it to collect um, genomic parasites or to conduct genomic parasite surveillance at the national level? Uh, I, I, I just would ap approach this in two areas. The first angle is collecting the data. That hasn't been a big deal. It hasn't been a big problem, although the samples quite often collected doesn't meet the quality we desire. But the biggest hurdle is generating the data. I, I, I normally want to refer to our own cases. 
in the early 2000s when we started talking to different collaborators in the north that would want to really get genomic surveillance incorporated into all the programs we work with. Many people laughed at us. They never thought this could be realistic or would, uh, it's something that, I mean, everyone sensible would think of investing in. Is just after 20 years now, the world has realized that we need genomic surveillance if we really want to tackle all the diseases we have and those which will emerge in the future. The case example which Diana gave of COVID-19 is really critical because we had the technology, genomic technologies. That's why within a year, we are able to have a vaccine which you have not been able to make for almost a century for malaria. So we are getting optimism because of the things that are happening and probably at the right time. So uh, it's, it's, it's feasible to get the, the genomic surveillance done within the national program, national malaria control program, but that's not easy. Uh, in my opinion, where we are going is actually lighter than where we came from. So I'm quite optimistic that uh, eventually molecular surveillance for malaria, not only malaria, actually pathogen genomics is going to become a, 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 a part and parcel of the malaria control and disease control programs. Fred, Fred Rose, um, I, I know my colleague Dauda and Guy is not available for the call today, but I, I thought I mm -hmm. might share the Senegal experience just because I think it is a really great um, sort of example of what Deos is just talking about. And yeah. looking we, we at- have a, We have a, you, you can talk do about that, that now, later? but we, we, yeah, we, we do have slides for Senegal. Okay, but you can, great. You can we can talk that. about it later then yeah. if you want, but it, it is this yeah. idea of, as Deos was talking about, really integrating and using molecular surveillance to inform decision-making. So right. just want to emphasize that theme. Thanks. No, and, and that's great. And I mean, we encourage, uh, um, especially people who work with the National Malaria Control Programs, if there are any here and they have specific examples they would like to share. Uh, this, uh, you can do this with the chat box or just let us know. But I think that the community we have in this masterclass is really, really here for that. So uh, thank you so, so much for that. Sheila, did you finish? Or? Yes, yes, you can go ahead, Fred. Okay, thank you so much, Deus. Uh, let's talk a little bit of entomology. Uh, uh, mosquito biology or vector control. Uh, the malaria vector community in Africa is very diverse, uh, but people who study this claim that we actually still don't know much about it. Uh, here is an example of work from uh, 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 Dr. Marian Sinker from Imperial, and a slide that I stole from uh, Dan Nifsis uh, presentation. Is, this slide is available on the WHO website, so I assume it was public. Uh, and free to use as long as we record. But showing the, the diversity in some of the major and minor malaria vectors uh, in, in Africa and just why it's important for us to continue uh, monitoring this. I would like to move this back to Alistair and talk a little bit about the project you, and actually uh, Alistair and Mara, if, if you guys can, can, can join forces to, uh, to address this. But this is one of the flagship programs you guys run at the Sangha Institute, the 1000, the Gambi 1000, I think that's what you call it, the Gambi 1000 project. And one of the key questions you try to address here is you know, the baseline situation we were talking about. We're trying to create that even though it's already too late uh, to do that. There are many places in East Africa where Anopheles Gambi is becoming very difficult to find. And I doubt that we have uh, the sequence of Gambi in the age, days before resistance. So, you know, maybe if we have some archived information in our labs, but I, I feel like, you know, we, we kind of lost this opportunity. So before we ask you specific questions, can you just describe what the aim of the Gambi 1000 program is and how it can help address some of these questions that Deus was talking about? Sure. Uh, well, the original aim was to uh, sequence the genomes of at least a thousand individual mosquitoes collected from natural populations with as much representation as we could get of different geographies, ecological settings, um, and of the major malaria vector species within the Anopheles Gambi complex. Um, and I think uh, the goal 
of doing this was firstly to sort of push forward all of the kind of technology that you would need to sequence mosquitoes at scale, first of all. So we sort of knew or, or, or thought that ultimately using sequencing to perform genomic surveillance operationally would be something we want to do, but all of the technologies needed to be proven and adapted to mosquitoes. Um, and, uh, and so just proving that we could do it, proving that we could sequence at scale, proving that we could handle the data, developing all the kind of tools and methods to work with whole genome sequence data from, from Anopheles mosquitoes was, was the first objective. Uh, the second objective was to um, learn something about the evolution of uh, mosquito populations within the Anopheles gambi complex. Um, we, we didn't have, we were mostly focused on uh, uh, geographical sampling, so we didn't have uh, time series from within any individual country, but um, when you sample from any location, you can, uh, you can make inferences about which parts of the genome have been evolving, and you can make comparisons between different locations as well. So we, we were interested to begin to study how uh, these populations have been changing and evolving, particularly over the last 20 years in response to um, malaria control interventions. And the last objective, I think, was really to provide a platform for genomic surveillance. So uh, having all of the methods, having this baseline data, or not truly baseline, as you say, because many of these populations are sampled uh, you know, well since the introduction of insecticides, but at least you know, some sort of baseline before we go into this kind of new round of third generation IRS and dual AI nets and all, all of that kind of thing. Having, having a set of reference data sets with which to compare um, and having high quality data with which to, to observe new events going forwards. I think building that platform of data and methods to do genomic surveillance was really, was, was another goal. Was it necessary for you to have this data collected or is it necessary for people doing this kind of work to have this data collected at the same time? Well, I think that, so going forwards, if we are thinking about genomic surveillance and actually yeah. monitoring populations using genomics, I think absolutely yes. I think we want to have contemporary mosquito collections and we uh, want to have them um, uh, relatively synchronized. So we have comparable data from different locations. And I think we want to follow Sentinel sites over time. So we're not just you know, sampling different locations in different ways, but we actually have regular sampling frames, regular sampling sites, and we really try and follow populations through time so that when something does change or we observe something changing, we can with confidence say, yes, something really has changed in this population. Yeah. Why do you think it's changed? So I think so, going forward, that's very important. Yeah, so, so before we leave this slide, what are some of the key, what is the biggest message, the, the, the big news here? Um, th this is the second publication from the Genome 1000 program. You initially published one with about 700 mosquitoes. This one has 1,142 mosquitoes from across several countries. What are the key messages here? And, and I see, I, I hope that you can talk about SNPs. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Well, that's, that's one of the things, yeah. Well, so, so yeah, so I think, I think there's three key messages, really, that, that come out of this. The first is that uh, Anopheles mosquitoes are genetically very diverse. They, uh, they have many, many SNPs. So when you actually uh, look at natural populations of mosquitoes, you find and you look at every position in their genome, you find that the majority of the positions in their genome vary. So almost every other position of the genome, you will find some variation between different mosquitoes. And that's, uh, that's very different from humans because if you compare two humans, uh, humans are very boring in comparison. You know, most of the letters in our genomes will be identical and we only vary a, a, a very small fraction of the letters in our genome. The mosquitoes are very, very genetically diverse. Um, and that's a reflection probably of their very large population size as well as the, the connectivity of their populations. Um, but that's, and, and they're one of the most genetically diverse species uh, on earth. So they're right out at the end of the kind of spectrum of, of how genetically diverse any animals are. And this, this presents a number of challenges, um, uh, but also some interesting opportunities. I think that the second message is that um, we're learning something about the species in the Gambi complex here, because 
we see differences between the different species. So in the, in the, in the first project phase, we, and, and the second project phase, which is reported here, we looked at Anopheles gambi and Anopheles caluti, and uh, we see some differences in terms of how those populations are structured. For example, across most of Western Central Africa, Anopheles gambi from one location, you, that you can't differentiate it from another location. It looks like basically, you know, there's almost even interbreeding of mosquitoes across a very large geographical range, whereas Anopheles caluti is much more structured. And I think this is suggesting to us that there are important ecological differences or behavioral differences between these different mosquitoes. Um, but also beyond that, in terms of mosquito species, we're seeing evidence for several cryptic species within the Gambi complex, which we didn't know about. So I think, you know, our understanding of the Anopheles Gambi complex, how many different species there are and what the kind of fundamental differences are between those, those different species is, um, is, is, is starting to come to light a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but the third thing was it was was really about insecticide resistance and just how much diversity there was in uh, in insecticide resistance genes. You know, I think before we came to this study, insecticide resistance um, studies in, in Anopheles gambi mostly looked at one or two SNPs. Um, but what we find when we look at uh, the whole genome is we find that uh, at least 10 different genes across the whole genome are involved in some way in insecticide resistance. And in each of those 10 genes, you're seeing 10 or 20 different mutations, all of which look like they may be conferring some kind of resistance. So the genetic and molecular complexity of insecticide resistance is much greater, I think, than we had in the appreciation for. And, and just to confirm that the, all this data is publicly available and anybody interested can actually read through it. Uh, I don't mean to cause any fears, but I remember in my last conversation with you, you did tell me that even in Tanzania, you see, you know, species that look different than yes. what we know. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, so we've just released data from the third and final phase of the of the uh, Thousand Genomes project. Um, those data are open access, so anyone can access those data. Anyone can use them to analyze, discover, yeah. make discoveries. Um, uh, and, and that was really another sort of key objective of the project was to build an open data resource which could power and accelerate the next generation of research within the community. So I should have, I should have said that yeah. earlier. But yes, we're, in, in, in East Africa, we see um, uh, on the coast in both Kenya and coastal Tanzania, we see some mosquitoes which don't look like Anopheles gambi, um, but live alongside Anopheles gambi. So uh, there's suggestion here that there is a cryptic species um, which we didn't perhaps know about uh, and which we, I think, would need some more sampling to investigate and understand a bit better. Yeah, so entomologists there, you need to do that. I want to just, before we go to Mara, just bring back uh, uh, Professor Diane uh, briefly. Uh, Diane, you want to stress this point on uh, the longitudinal surveillance. Uh, please go ahead. That's right. Uh, thanks, Fredros, and, and thanks, Alistair, for that. I just wanted to emphasize one of the points that Alistair made, and it relates also to Deus's comments, and that is that in order to uh, understand changes, whether it's spread of insecticide resistance or spread of drug resistance or emergence of, of new of yet to be you know, identified features of a genome, a critical aspect is longitudinal sampling. And so sampling over time from the same places so that you can infer uh, that the changes you see are in fact related to whatever is changing in the environment. So an example might be uh, the introduction of a new insecticide or the inter introduction of a new drug or a vaccine. And so I think for those of you thinking about this, um, perhaps more important than sampling huge numbers of samples is to sample longitudinally um, so that you understand changes in, in time. And, and obviously also as you sample in different ge geographic ranges, uh, changes in space. So this is something which we perhaps have not emphasized enough in our thinking and talking about this, but it's a critical point, both for mosquitoes and for parasites. Thank you. 
thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot. And, uh, let's proceed to that. And I mean, we, we had a, a fantastic masterclass with, uh, with uh, my friend Charles Wonji from Cameroon. And, and he was telling us, you know, we, we have all these arguments uh, with, uh, with Charles and other people before that, you know, a lot of NMCPs can make a decision on which pesticide to use based on bioassays. You know, they don't need molecular biology to decide what to do. Uh, Charles has convinced me otherwise uh, because of the great work they're doing. And uh, on the basis of this, uh, a student of us, a colleague of mine sent a question here to, to uh, Mamara and Alistair uh, related to the work you've done on the, on the Gambi 1000 pro program there. And the question, if I can read it, at the, the, the bottom there is, uh, how can the information on the high frequency of KDR and SIP genes across the study region be used by decision makers? Uh, maybe Mara can, can go, or, or Alistair, one of you. I think Alistair is best positioned to answer that specific question, but I, would, I just wanted to mention one quick thing about uh, the baseline and looking back in time. Um, yeah. I remember when we started the AG1000G uh, project, um, it was being led out of Sanger through Dominic Kwiatkowski, and I was actually a postdoc at Imperial, and, and a bunch of vector biologists got invited up, and we all just thought this was nuts because... Why would you just sequence a bunch of random mosquitoes from across Africa that had no phenotypes associated with them? You know, what, what is the point of this? And now it's just par for the course. And it, that baseline concept is so critical because it is, it doesn't sort of matter what you've looked at. <laughs> it matters yeah. that you've looked at a lot and that you look at them regularly. Um, and the more you know about the phenotype that you can layer on, wonderful, because that gives you deeper insight into the, into why things are changing, but actually, Part of the answer, I think, to this question is monitoring that things, you can see things changing in the genome very fast if you have right. good sampling yeah. and you have a good design and you have what Diane is talking about, that very regular, that rhythm of just kind of, you know, doing true surveillance. You're watching regularly, you have a strategy. Um, so, you know, 10 years on, all those vector biologists who went and, and basically we called it freezer trawling, they went back to their freezers to try to pull out random mosquitoes that they'd collected over the past decade. <laughs> Um, has been the baseline foundation for us understanding what do Anopheles, Gambi, and Calusian Arabiensis populations, what is the genetic diversity? We know so much more now, having done that, even detached from any kind of phenotypes, um, yeah. that puts us in such a good position to do this kind of monitoring. And the last thing, point I wanted to make is that we do have samples from before insecticide resistance, and we are looking at them. We have sequenced over 200 historic anophilines collected from 1910 onwards. So we are actually looking at these genomes. They're all collected in, in, in museums and we're able to get decent coverage. And actually we've been looking specifically so far at BGSC and not seeing KDR um, in any of these historic samples yet, which is a little bit surprising. I mean, we still have small numbers, but actually I would have thought it would have started appearing by the sixties or seventies with DDT and we're still not seeing it there yet. Um, but I'll pass over to Alistair for this particular question because he's position to answer that. Um, no, that's, that's a fantastic reflection on, um, on how these things have come together and how they sort of panned out. And I think, um, I mean, I, I'd love to speak specifically about this question because I think this is one of the key uh, kind of questions about how genomics could inform insecticide resistance management. Um, but bef before I do, I think I just want to kind of carry on that thread about longitudinal sampling. <laughs> um, just because, you know, for me, and, and going, going back to the question that Sheila asked earlier, you know, what, what do you think is the most exciting application of genomics for, for uh, vector surveillance? You know, uh, I think it's just important to sort of recognize that, you know, there's a very big change happening right now in terms of uh, malaria vector control. Um, many control programs that were doing IRS have switched their major IRS compound over the last two to three years, they're switching away from pyrethroids and carbamates to uh, so-called third generation IRS using organophosphates, using neonicotinoids. Um, and uh, also my understanding is that the new nets which incorporate pyrethroids plus yes. some of the compounds are uh, being piloted and are planned for major deployments over the, last, over the next sort of two to three years. And this, this is one of the biggest changes in malaria, in malaria control uh, you know, 
in, in the last decade. And this is inevitably, I think, going to result in new forms of insecticide resistance emerging. You know, if you go all, all the way back to the, to the 1950s when the first IRS programs were being trialed, in, in those programs where, for example, Dialgrin was being deployed, it was within a time frame of one to two years that resistance emerged. So over the, over the next three to four years, I would expect that there will be a number of new and important resistance variants emerging in mosquito populations. And I think the one thing that genomics fairness can add is we can see those things happening a bit sooner than we would through doing bioassays. I think we need to do bioassays because those bioassays give us confirmation, they give us a phenotype that it, it is vital, but we can see these things emerging potentially sooner. And that gives us a new thread of data of information that we can uh, yeah. use to address all of these other issues and in, in how to actually... And, and if, I may, if, if we may interrupt you there, and I, I, I see that Charles is on the call as well, and Charles, feel free to jump in and, and, and to explain this specific area because you work on it quite a lot. At the moment, people do the, the phenotypic assays, you know, the... the there was, please forgive as entomologists, we are getting lost here. <laughs> Don't mind. Uh, so, Alistair, at the moment, people no do problems. the bio... I'm learning as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Alistair, at the moment, we do the biases first, and then after that, we do the genetics. You seem to be suggesting that as the technology improves, it may be helpful to actually have the genetics uh, um, come first. Is that, is that right? Well, I, I, I think that we, we could imagine a scenario where we, we're doing both as part of routine surveillance. So as part of yeah. routine surveillance, we're collecting mosquitoes in a surveillance frame. So all of the things that Diane said, we're trying to match our sampling frames, we have a longitudinal plan. We're collecting mosquitoes in a way that is, you know, uh, as unbiased as we can be. And then some of those mosquitoes are going for bioassays and we're figuring out what fraction of those are phenotypically resistant, but then some fraction of those mosquitoes are also going for, for genome sequencing. Yeah. And if we can turn that around quickly, and there's no reason why we can't, you know, if we can get those data turned around and back to people within a matter of months, then you will see uh, some, you'll see an event very much like the emergence of B117 in, in, in COVID in Kent, where suddenly a new strain, a new variant emerges and appears to be spreading. And the genome sequencing shows us that and raises some kind of an alarm bell. But at the same right. time, you might see this, the, the signals of some increase in phenotypic resistance. And you know the, the parallel in COVID was that in Kent, COVID was spreading despite the fact that the rest of the country was in a national lockdown. So Kent was the only place where COVID was spreading at the time. And so in that setting, the genomic data, which showed us that something unusual was happening, combined with the epidemiological data that showed us that something was un unusual was happening, came together to make a very, very strong case that something needed to be yeah. done. And, and that's what made the difference. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Charles, did you want to comment on this? Yes, Fregos. Thank you yeah, uh, for all the speakers for explaining so well what is going on. And again, to highlight the, the role of genomics is really so important if we need to uh, anticipate. Because so far, uh, in malaria in vector control, we haven't been proactive. We have been reactive uh, because it's only when resistance has been uh, already selected and uh, uh, present in the population, the high frequency, that we are detecting them. Why? Because we are only relying on the phenotypic uh, detection with bioassays. And I think, as Alistair was saying, we definitely need to combine both the phenotypic uh, detection with the genomic detection. And uh, in the new insecticide, for the new insecticide coming on the market, like uh, the, in the case of chlorophenam P, neonicotinoid, for which resistance is not high yet we need to take advantage of the genomic tools to uh, detect those potential resistance gene and variants, which will allow control program to start uh, uh, mapping, detecting this resistance at the early stage uh, when the frequency is still low, because it's only at that time that we can implement a suitable resistance management strategy. 
So yeah. this is why it is important. And second thing also is uh, so far for the uh, for the metabolic resistance genes, we haven't got uh, robust DNA-based diagnostic tools, mainly because we haven't been successful a lot in detecting the causative markers. If you look for KGR, uh, in maybe 1998, we got a PCR diagnostics, which has enabled people to, uh, to uh, detect this uh, resistance easily. It's only re recently for P450 that we have been successful in designing those uh, PCR-based diagnostic. I think if you have them more, control program will be more confident in deploying tools like PBONet, because they know that in their area, resistance is mainly driven by P450. And that will give them confidence in uh, choosing the right control tools for their region, because that's the challenge with, with uh, mosquitoes. Uh, you, you saw the, the genomic diversity. What, what is true in uh, Central Africa is not true in Southern Africa. And how will you know if you don't have the tools to detect what is going on in your location? And I think genomic has a, 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 is quite powerful in uh, providing a deep insight. And I think that is something we could do now, but we need to anticipate for the coming insecticides like neonicotinoid and chlorophenampi. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Charles, for this. You made um, um, in the beginning, you know, be proactive instead of being reactive. Um, of course, and we will discuss this uh, uh, in this masterclass today. There are challenges with the technologies, the tools, the you know, the expertise. So things that we still need to talk about include, you know, the trained personnel to do this, the availability of uh, technologies for this, how do we scale this up? And, and, and so stay tuned for that. But thank you so much, Charles, for for the clarification. Uh, we're going to proceed now. Uh, and uh, I want to bring back Mara uh, uh, real quick on this. Sarah, please uh, uh, they will stay with us. Don't go away. Uh, Mara, another concern that came out of the Gambi 1000 program was these uh, um, uh, mixtures that you have with Gambian Colossi in some parts of West Africa. Part of the work that you've, you've done, try to resolve this uh, 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 as being these amplicon panels that your lab has created that detects not just the species, but also malaria parasite in the mosquito. Uh, I know this work is not published yet, but there's a preprint online. Uh, so is it okay if you speak about it? I would love the opportunity to speak, especially to the, this audience who- um, Please, yeah. Uh, so what did, do you want me to just go over what it does? For yeah, this? yeah, yeah. It's, we put a little bit of information from here, but maybe yeah. it's not, it would be clearer oh. if you explain. Yeah. In the upper right corner there, you see a schematic of the chromosomes um, across albumanus, Gambi, and Finestis. And albumanus and Gambi are thought to be about 100 million years diverged. So really different insects, but both malaria vectors. Um, the last time they probably had contact with each other was when Africa and South America were touching. So we're talking a very long time ago. Um, so uh, the little kind of colored squares that you can see all over those lines are, low, are positions in the genome that are kind of universal in the sense that uh, they are flanked by little pieces of DNA that are identical or really, really similar across all Anopheles species, all that 100 million years of evolution, all 500 species as far as we know. Right now we've actually only got 20 or so species genomes, so we don't know for sure that this is um, across all Anopheles, but uh, it, is, um, it is promising that it works across Albumanus and Gambi, that much divergence. So, um, what we do is we go in and do that thing called amplicon sequencing, that targeted uh, yeah. kind of investigation of particular regions. And actually in the sense of like going after like a drug resistance mutation or insecticide resistance mutation, this amplicon panel is not doing that at all. It's just looking at genetic variation in these mosquitoes. And it's then trying to say, uh, if you apply it to a lot of individual mosquitoes, what species does this mosquito look the most like? When I look at all 60 of these places in the genome, who is this mosquito? Is it Anopheles gambi? Is it Anopheles caluzzi? And that's what the lower right corner is showing is actually, um, we can really very clearly differentiate caluzzi and gambi who are quite similar to each other genetically. Um, 
And so that kind of red cluster to the left and that more colorful yellow, green and blue cluster to the right are the two species. Um, and that, that sort of figure that's super tiny in the middle with a sort of slightly um, arching bunch of dots. Yeah, that one um, on the x-axis there is the names of 50 different species of Anopheles uh, mosquitoes. And through our partners, um, some of whom are on the call I see today, Brandy and Diego and others, we have DNA from um, these 50 different species that we tested this panel on. And we basically created a reference index. So we know at these 60 loci, what does each species look like? What does its sequence like? And that slight sloping suggests that things that are much more different from Anopheles gambi, very distant genetically, we're getting fewer of those amplicons. Maybe we only get 40 of them amplifying. So we lose out on signal from 20, but actually that absence of signal still becomes signal. So it's useful in the understanding of divergence. Um, so what I really want to convey here is that this is a panel that you can take a single mosquito and our project over the next five years, and I'm basically really encouraging anybody to reach out to me who's, look, who's, studying, vector, who's studying vector genomics, who's trying to study vector diversity. If you're sampling in different places and you don't know what you have, um, or if you have a question about indoor and outdoor biting or um, larval habitat, you know, there's so many ways in which this panel can be useful to you. And we want to work with you to push your samples through this panel. We have um, ambitions to do half a million mosquitoes in the next five years on this panel. So we have budget to do that and we have um, interest in doing that longitudinal sampling. So if you're implementing a new net, uh, a new net you know, campaign, if you collect before, during and after, and you wanna see how things change in terms of what species are present and how the population structure might vary, please get in touch with us. Um, we would be really keen to work with you. But effectively, we will, what we'll be doing is we've got a panel that works now. We put mosquitoes into wells of 96 well plates. So every mosquito just goes into a well. We non-destructively extract the DNA which means that when you see something weird like that species in Tanzania that Alistair was talking about, um, you can go back to it, you still have it, but you're, you're, you've looked at its DNA, you know it's different, and now you can go back to it and look at its morphology and see, is there something there that was slightly different <laughs> that we just didn't notice before because it looks so much like Gambi, but actually something is different. Um, so we've got this non-destructive approach and, um, and then we do a PCR amplification on these 62 loci. But the other exciting part of this panel is it's targeting mitochondrial loci in the plasmodium parasite too, in a generic sense as well. So for every mosquito, we can also say whether it's carrying parasites or not. We can't say whether it's transmitting parasites because of course it could have a blood meal full of asexual parasites. But if you are really interested in transmission, you can do a careful dissection of the head thorax off from the abdomen. And then we would be able to say, this is the species, this is its population structure and it's carrying plasmodium parasites or not. So, we all know, I mean, many of the people on this call will have had years of experience either doing morphological diagnostics, which are tricky and time consuming, important, um, and this isn't going to replace it, but it's going to complement it the way we, we have been talking about. You need the right tool for the right question. And actually for Gambi, complex morphology doesn't get you anywhere, right? It only gets you to the complex. <laughs> so you need a tool anyway. And the tools we've developed over the last 20 years are all around PCR diagnostics. So you, you have a little, you know, PCR, you see a band on a gel and it's 400 bases and it's Gambi and it's 300 bases and it's Caluzzi. But all those ones that give you a weird band or a no band, you know, you don't know anything about those and you ignore them because what else can you do, right? There's nothing, yeah. there's nothing else you can do. And a single marker also is not representative of the rest of the genome. You can, you can see something and it says it's Caluzzi, but actually the rest of the genome looks like Gambi. Um, so I think I'm really optimistic. I'm so excited about this tool that yeah. uh, I think it will give us a whole new way of really doing um, surveillance on mosquitoes. What is it? What's its population structure? So you can see in that bottom right corner that it, it does show you population structure. That's not whole genome sequence data there. That is just these 10 KB of data uh, across those mosquitoes. Um, yeah. Gives yeah, you population thanks. structure. It tells you if the mosquito is carrying parasites and what species of parasite. Excellent. And, and already you have uh, a panel with uh, how many mosquitoes are those? Um, about 14 species that, that you already have reference genomes for, right? This is a different project, yes. Yeah. So we're, we've created um, through funding from the Gates Foundation. We've been really interested in how can we improve the reference genomes for Anopheles. There are a lot out yeah. there. We're really fortunate. 
in this field already to have so many genomes for so many species. But, yeah. um, you know, there's 50 different mosquitoes that we know of, and there's probably more than that, 50 different species that so, are regularly so the, main, the, the main reason we bring this up is, uh, is my colleague Shayla has a number of questions about, about this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop this for her, but it will be related to this slide, reference genomes, what's available, what can we use for some of the inversions that we have right now? Sheila, please. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Yeah, um, yeah. so as Anopheles Stephensai is, is becoming a huge threat. Um, it was previously in Southeast Asia and the Arabian Peninsula, but now we are seeing it in the Horn of Africa. So how can we leverage these methodologies from the genomic surveillance to sort of help mitigate this threat that we are seeing at the moment? Dr. Mara, would you like to respond to this? So, um, I mean, I guess this is a question about, is this a question about collection and, and making sure that we understand this, this sort of dimension? No, I, I, I don't know about, about Sheila, but one, one thing that might be interesting, and Sheila, you can correct me if I'm wrong with this, would be even if we had, you know, information about Kaluti, about, um, Stephen Sai, do we have a reference genome for it? We don't. Yes, uh, there, is a, there is a reference genome for Stephen Sai. Do we? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So would it be the same with the one, the, the mosquitoes that we are seeing in Africa? Or do we need that, to? That reference genome would work very well to, to understand something about the diversity of the, of the individual mosquitoes that are spreading in Africa. Um, because it doesn't need to be a perfect match. You just need to have enough of a, I, you know, similarity to use a reference genome to kind of understand where your small pieces of your genome sit. So you wouldn't want to map Stephen's eye to the Gambi reference genome. Uh, that wouldn't, that would be, I mean, you could, but you really wouldn't get the kind of information that you're as interested in. Um, but there is a Stephen's eye genome already. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I think Fred, no further questions. I was working with the assumption that we didn't have a Stephen's eye genome. Yes. That's, that's, uh, that's great. But I mean, I guess carry, carrying on from what Shayla is saying, and this is a question to uh, uh, all of you, maybe even Sarah and and, uh, and Diane and Deus. This is one case where we might need to advance our genomics faster than the fieldwork, I guess. Uh, when Alistair told me there was a species in Tanzania, they couldn't march into the Gambi group. The first question I asked him was, oh man, could that be something else? And of course, I'm not a molecular biologist, so I don't uh, understand exactly how these things work, but I'm, I'm wondering generally if the case of Anopheles Stephensai is one where we could advance genomics faster, the way Sheila was saying, and pick up whatever is there. If we already have some references, we can align it to. Any comments on this? Can I can I go first, Fredros? Yes, Fredros. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, Fredros. I I, I personal first address the question which was directed to Alista about what genomics can be used for. For example, should we be doing uh, tunnel sensitivity tests, or should we be focusing on genomics or both? At the moment, I think that the answer is is not that simple, but we do know that genomics is now getting an, an, a, a greater attention than uh, anyone expected. And um, I wanted to give an example of the uh, parasites. It took us years to know the resistance markers for chloroquine. And once when we knew that, it was too late. The situation had gone worse and we lost chloroquine. And so, but for artemisinins, which were deployed in Africa and probably in the world in the last 20 years, within a, a short period of time, we knew the, the markers of artemisinin resistance. And now we are able to track it. Recently, we were able to know that actually artemisinin resistance is in Africa and it was discovered in, in Rwanda. And this is because we had the tools. So the question is not either or or, or none, the question is, we have the tools and they're incredible tools, although they are very expensive, but the cost outweighs the, the, the I mean, whatever we would want or skepticism. So we need to get genomics right on and, and use it. 
So that being said, there is no hesitation. If we can use it for tracking mosquitoes, whether Stephen size in Africa or not, is spreading from the Horn of Africa to other regions, let's go for it. Yeah. And, and again, once we establish temporal corrections of samples, we can address any questions at any time, won't be constrained. But if we don't get started, the moment we, are, we try to answer the questions we want, and for example, we, we, if we had samples, maybe from the past in the 60s, people would be able to track and say specifically or exactly, <laughs> sorry, when did the chloroquine resistance actually start? People talk of 1978, that's when clinical resistance began, but do we really know when it started in Africa? We don't. And it's simply because we don't have the, 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 the reference samples would be using. So for that matter, I would say, we don't need to ask ourselves any question of whether we need or we don't. Yeah. The question is how best can we utilize genomics? And for me, it would be in a holistic way, uh, as long as we are strategic enough not to waste the resources, but I'm quite optimistic that with right sampling, temporal trends can be established at any time. And, and, and I can guarantee you to be very useful uh, in containment and in whatever and, and whatever policy and decisions we want to make. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Sheila, please. Back to you, Sheila. Yeah, Fred, I don't think I have any questions on an off-list defense so we can move ahead. Okay. I'm sorry if I muted someone by mistake. I was trying to mute uh, our colleague who was talking. So I might have muted some of our experts by mistake. Please unmute yourself. Uh, okay, so let, let's proceed then. Um, you know, on the question of Stephen Sai, we don't have to dwell on this. We are skipping it. We had a masterclass here uh, on this before. We were shown uh, the relationship that these have with mosquitoes from other places like Pakistan, I had a follow-up discussion with our friends from CDC. And I think at the moment, we know that these mosquitoes are related to the mosquitoes from South Africa, but we do not know when they arrived in Africa. So I think that question of when it arrived is still uh, pending. And if anybody has any answers on that, please let us know. Like Deus was saying, it's the same with the chloroquine situation. So anybody who has any additional information on when, if the Stephen side we have in the Horn of Africa is a new, inversion or something that has been there, uh, that, that might be helpful. We're gonna move now out of, away from vectors to parasites. And we will have a long discussion again now with uh, Deus, uh, Sarah and, uh, uh, and uh, Professor Diane Webb. And uh, hopefully uh, Mara and Alistair, you can join in as well on multiple se sections of this. The first is back to um, the genome. Um, um, Sarah, this is, this is a question for you. So the human malaria parasite sequence also early in about 20 years ago, uh, the, the, the genome comes out, uh, a fairly large one, if, if you like, 22 million base pairs. Uh, all that detail, fine, yeah, all nice. But if you read that paper, at the, in the conclusion, they have this statement, which I found very interesting. In the short term, however, this is what the writers say, the genome sequences alone provide little relief to the suffering from malaria. The work reported here and elsewhere need to be accompanied by larger efforts to develop methods to control the disease. A question we ask, we, we have here for uh, Sarah and, uh, and Diane is, to what extent have we addressed the concerns of uh, Dr. Gardner and colleagues and the writing at this time? And I, I realize that you guys co-authored this uh, most likely. So how much have we advanced since this uh, period? Yeah, so I think there's been a, a lot of advancements. Um, I would say that as we've been talking about that genetics and genomics is uh, informing us in different ways. So we've been talking a lot about the changes over time, the evolution and the information that that gives us about, for example, transmission, but also how genetics and genomics is now part of, integral part of 
drug development and vaccine development and our vaccine challenges. So over time, we've become and we incorporate genetics and genomics to inform all of these processes. So new drug discovery or target identification uses genetics and genomics to figure out what regions of the parasite genome, for example, are, are affected by this. And we can use gene editing technologies to confirm that these play a role. With regard to vaccines, we can look at the effects of a vaccine and particular vaccine parasite types, how they change in the population over time. And again, genetics and genomics helps inform what are the best designs for vaccines. With regard to diagnostics, we've seen changes, for example, in HRP2, 3 deletion that can impact our diagnostic tools. And again, genetics can be used to help understand how compromise to diagnostics may be playing a role or how other species may be involved in diagnostic failure. So I think we have come a long way in integrating genetics and genomics with all of these applications and tools that we do need for really reducing the malaria burden and really helping in that effort to try to, to work towards elimination of malaria and to preserve and save our tools. You know, again, we've talked about early warning of insecticide or drug resistance. Knowing these things can help us develop strategies, uh, whether it be trading off different drug combinations or ways and strategies that we can keep, we can extend the tools that we have as well to develop new tools. So I think more and more we're, we're using genetics and genomics as an integrated part of our tool discovery and our tool, you know, saving our tools and then also where and when to apply those tools. So I think that's, that's part of the, the, how far we've come. I, there's obviously more work to be done, but I think we have made great gains in this effort because we've been able to integrate genetics and genomics into these activities. And Diane may want to comment as well, but. Yeah, yeah. I, I would just make one contrast perhaps, um, you know, you know, malaria and, and in some ways vector biology, I uh, have a long history, right? Of tools to diagnose and ways to, you know, understand mosquito species. So introducing new technology is always a challenge because the question is, what does this give us over what we already have? And, and I think Sarah's given some great examples. And I think, again, it's this question of what value does genomic information add? But if you contrast that uh, to something like, and we'll use SARS-CoV-2, but the same thing could be said for Ebola or Zika virus, Diseases where there's not a history, right? Where there isn't actually a developed methodology, yeah. genomics was key. I think Deus mentioned this already in terms of vaccine discovery. Getting the sequence was critical to making a vaccine. Um, the malaria vaccine was developed, in fact, before much was known about the sequence. And you might not have ever picked CSP as a vaccine candidate, if you've known that it was highly variable in the C-terminal region or AMA1 or, you know, so, so I think, it's, you know, some of the contrast is the different times, but also the different histories. Um, and I think malaria is particularly challenging because I've heard the argument, countries have eliminated malaria without knowing anything uh, about the molecular biology of either the parasite or the mosquito. But I think it is very important to understand that these tools can give you advantages and move much faster, as Deus has pointed out, than we've done previously. So I think it's important not to, you know, kind of say either or we have to do classical methodology, but, but we have to embrace this and really use it to, to its full extent. And yeah. both in mosquito biology and in parasite biology, I, I'd say if you had to come away with one word, it's diversity. That is, as Alistair said, uh, the, the mosquitoes, the, the Anopheles mosquitoes are very diverse. I would also say that of the parasites, they're among the most diverse infectious organisms on the planet. And so understanding that uh, means that 
you know, not every parasite is created equal and not every intervention that you're going to bring will uniformly impact either the parasite in the case of parasite directed interventions or the mosquito in the case of mosquito uh, impact there, you know, implementation or, or targets. And so I, I just think it's important for us to open our minds, but not, you know, say, oh, molecular biology is the complete answer or the old technologies are the complete answer. We're going to need both. And, and I think this, that's why this master class is so exciting. Yeah, and Dan, one of the, um, in, in this original public publication, one of the points that the authors stressed was just how many of the genes were associated with immune aversion. Uh, just a very yeah, big I mean, proportion and, of and this that's was... the explanation for much yeah. of the diversity. It's not the only explanation for diversity, but the most diverse genes are genes that are associated either with known antigens or with uh, genes that are expressed on the surface of the parasite or on the surface of the infected red cell, where you can imagine they would come in contact with the immune system. And this and, and other uh, work on diversity uh, really implies that the driving selective force over history uh, for the malaria parasite is the human immune system. There, is a, there are a subset of diverse genes that are associated with different geographic regions. And the hypothesis there is that uh, in fact, these are uh, driven by mosquito parasite interactions. And there are some clear demonstrations of that, for example, PFS 47. Um, and its uh, ability, you know, the genetic variation correlates well with the ability to be uh, transmitted by a uh, different anopheline uh, subspecies. And so I, I do think that this, um, this is uh, an important, you know, feature of the, of the parasite diversity is that it is likely mostly due to immune selection. Most of the genes that are drug resistant markers are except in the sites which are mutated, uh, associated with drug resistance, most of the other, you know, A's, C's, G's, and T's in those genes are identical across parasite populations, indicating an otherwise very conserved gene. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I mean, I, I was initially struggling with what this is, but I think a lot of questions that have been raised about why changes. And I, I noticed this also with the discussion on the mosquito side, what is it that is driving the change when you put uh, uh, an organism under some kind of a pressure? So uh, thanks uh, Dan for the clarification about how the immune system might be driving the allelic variation that you have on the plasmodium gene sequences. We have a follow-up uh, question here that uh, will go to Deus. Uh, uh, we will skip this slide. Of course, around the same time you had the Gambi uh, sequence as well come out, uh, but for the sake of time, we will not discuss that. So uh, Deus, um, uh, Deus and, and, and colleagues, you guys have uh, released this publication two years ago. Um, uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, Shell and myself found this a great overview for preparation of the masterclass. Uh, part of the the discussion you had here was about some of the opportunities, but also some of the challenges that we have right now. And of course, there's the amplicon consequence and the whole genome sequencing there, but we've already discussed that part. But there was, it would be nice to have a discussion with you now about, you know, first of all, taking the Tanzanian perspective and just take us through some of the challenges that we face right now. But more importantly, how are we uh, prepared to tackle these this, uh, challenges going forward to actually make next generation sequencing possibility, not just for PFAS separum, but also for the vector side. Back to you, Dils. Did we lose Dils? He looks like he's dropped off. Oh man, I'm so No, he had connection problems. Yeah, he's there, but he's muted. Is he? 
I don't know if he's unable to. Oh, okay. Fred was, I was trying to move out to get a much better internet. I hope you can okay. hear me now. Yeah. Did you, did you hear the question? Has, yes. Um, okay. Like the, challenge, the challenges we are facing as yes. we try to get NGS capability on the ground. And yes. so uh, as we discussed- You can our, start with uh, the internet. <laughs> I, I mean, if, if anyone can sort that out, I probably would give him or her my entire fortune. In because- We're waiting for Starlink. Uh, the, I, so. I mean, it, 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 oh, okay, we do have lots of challenges, but as we venture into genomics, which in our case, we are talking about three things. The capacity to collect samples that can make useful <clears throat> inferences can generate better results. That's not trivial. It's something we are uh, addressing really critically. And then the capacity to generate the, the best type of genomics data, that's another angle. And we are also uh, working on that. And the final uh, area, that is the capacity to analyze the data. That's where Alista and for bioinformatics are also supporting us. So uh, as I started off, when, when, when I had a, my first chance, we, I mean, no one ever listened to us when we started talking about the need to have the capacity on the ground. Uh, I first did my uh, PCR work on Plasmodium around 2004, and not what uh, Fedros, I had to move from Tanga to Ifakara, that's, that's about 500 miles to do MSP, MSP2 genotyping. We didn't have the PCR machines, we didn't have the hoods, we didn't have whatever. So, and, and, and whenever we started talking about building that capability, everyone saw it as like an, an academic endeavor. So, we need to address those kind of things. And we have made uh, uh, great progress. At the moment, at least in country, we have several labs which have the capacity to at least generate simple uh, PCR data. Now moving into the genomics era, that's, that's a big mountain to climb, uh, to climb because of the three things I mentioned. We now embarking on the in initiative to build the genomics capacity in Tanzania. And we are lucky to have been able to get funding from the Gates Foundation. And uh, some of the things we are facing are really huge. One of them, the internet I spoke about, and I don't need to repeat it. The other thing is actually getting the right students or staff to work on this kind of complicated work. So getting the right staff who we can train to become future genomicists is not trivial. Moving to the bioinformatics side, we had two positions for postdocs and in, in the whole of Tanzania, we almost missed a single one. Uh, we finally found one who was working at another institution. And for the second position, we had to recruit someone and start in-house training. So uh, it, it, there are so many challenges, but, but I think uh, I would say the future is really bright, uh, particularly for young girls and boys who are ready to venture uh, into genomics and bioinformatics in Africa. <laughs> As we mentioned, uh, most of the disease programs are now thinking of having a genomic analysis as part and parcel of their programs. So yeah, back to you thanks, now. Thanks. I'm thanks, happy thanks. to answer any other questions. Thanks a lot. Would, would you mind making some comments about the the bioinformatics side, the computational capacity itself? Yes, Fredros. Uh, I'll give a, a simple and is a practical example. We started collecting samples for uh, parasite genomic analysis within malaria again, 
And um, our first genomic whole genome data has been out uh, within the PFK, PF3K uh, for about eight years now. And it's only recently our postdoc started making sensible analysis. I'm not a bioinformatician, so I had the data sitting in the public uh, database, but I couldn't make any use of it. Recently, the, student has, the students have now started to do some analysis. We are able to show, for example, the variability of CSP, which is a critical and for uh, RTSS in Tanzania, that is highly polymorphic. It's highly variable and probably the, the vaccine might not work in the country. We are starting now to make analysis uh, with the new guys coming in to show that we can identify the sources and things of parasites in Tanzania. For example, the paper we published last year in uh, molecular ecology showed clearly that we have the parasites in Tanzania, even in high transmission areas, are distinct and you can tell where they are coming from. But that couldn't have been possible if we didn't have the support of bioinformaticians who are currently not in the country. So with bioinformatics, there, there are probably three areas to address. First is the personnel, which I mentioned. The second is the network, the network, uh, in, uh, the internet capability, which is currently the hurdles. Uh, I'm not sure how we'll uh, navigate. And the third, is a, a computational capability that we are addressing slowly, but we still have the human side and the uh, internet connectivity because we are dealing with mega size data. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and we will come back to some of these issues because I would like us to also discuss the capacity building in the situation, <coughs> if, if you don't mind at some point. Uh, but before that, uh, we, we there, you know, because of time, we're gonna rush through a few, a few situations here, and then we want to work through uh, some NLCP applications as well. So, Sheila, please. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, still with you, Dr. Dews, um, how then do we ensure that we are getting the right sample, say, when we are looking at um, uh, parasite genomic surveillance? How, what really goes into this briefly? what the methodology really involves in terms of handling the DNA? Uh, I'll not go into the theoretical part. I'll give actually the practical experience. We started DNA collection in February uh, this year for our project. And we started after training over 400 uh, health facility staff to collect the DBS and we had training theoretical and practical in classes for two days. And then we had the follow-up training at the site when we deployed them back to their working stations. Can you believe that when we went to the samples we have poor quality? Crazy. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing is high level of supervision to ensure that the samples collected, collected have the desirable quality. So at the moment, we are still experimenting by uh, training our own in-house technicians. And then we go out and train the health facility staff uh, to be able to support us in collecting the samples. But in some areas, I can tell you, some clinicians and technicians are hesitant to support us collect the samples. So we still have a long way and it won't be easy to get the systems in place in a huge country like Tanzania, where we are currently sampling over 100 health facilities in, in 13 regions. Uh, so we'll go bit by bit to make sure that we train the right people on the ground, and then we train the supervisors at the central location. So the, the model we are trying to use, after we have trained the right people in the, the health facilities and train the supervisors at the central level, which to us is like the NMCP, I think we'll start from there and, 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 and move forward. Uh, at the moment, uh, I'll be lying to you if I, can, I, if I can say that we are able to collect good samples, which will be very useful in the future. We are still learning and, and I think the exercise we are doing will give us a better footing 
where we are informing everyone that whatever we are doing is for the transition period. We want at a particular period of time, all the sample collection, all the sample management, including archiving, and if possible, in some cases, including simple genotyping, should be done within the programs or with the support from the program or the support, the program seeking uh, external support. But the system we are working with now of researchers getting the upper arm in NMCP activity when it comes to molecular surveillance, in my opinion, will not be sustainable. If we don't bring NMCPs up to be able to own and run everything. So in areas where the collections are not doing well, the, the, the thing is, uh, this is the researcher thing. But once it becomes the program thing, uh, I believe uh, good data, good samples will be uh, well collected. Yeah, thank you very much, Dios. And, and it's interesting that you've mentioned that you are targeting the health facilities. Then my next question there is how, what, what is the criteria for, for where to sample or how to sample? How did you arrive at, you know, deciding that yes, we'll sample at the health facilities? I, I can tell you, Sheila, that was very hard. Because initially, I'm sorry, I have some flu and still disturbing me. So initially, we, we wanted to do surveillance uh, collections at 30 health facilities, and we didn't know how to uh, choose them. But lucky enough, we combined the uh, molecular surveillance for parasites and drug resistance with HRP2 deletion. HRP2 deletion has a template protocol, has a protocol. So for uh, routine surveillance using molecular uh, genomics tool, we don't have a template. We don't have ideas or guide guidelines on how to sample. So we anchored our molecular surveillance for parasite populations and drug resistance on HRP2 deletion. Because the HRP2 deletion has a, a better framework on how you should sample the region and how you should sample the health facilities. So I don't want to go into details. If anyone wants, uh, we can have a separate chart. So using the HRP2 deletion framework, where they recommend sampling 100 health facilities in a minimum of 10 regions, that's how we selected our 100 health uh, facilities. And then from there, for extended collections, we randomly selected a set of facilities of them, three in each region, where we are collecting more data and samples for uh, deeper analysis of parasite population. It's, it's not an easy way, but I think with the efforts we are doing now, uh, it will give us an opportunity to kind of uh, fine tuning the sampling procedures and, and, and including selection of the study sites. Yeah, thank you very much, Dales. Um, Dr. Mara, what's the story on the mosquito side? How do we, so, uh, conduct surveillance on the mosquito side, collecting the DNA from the mosquitoes. I think it's-, it's Any challenges, yeah. Challenges. Um, well, there are a number of challenges around, um, well, I think experimental design matters. If you're interested in a particular question, you need to have sufficient sample numbers. Um, I think it's laborious collecting mosquitoes. Um, it's, it takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, in terms of the actual getting the samples into a suitable condition to sequence, actually, that's not so challenging for mosquitoes because they're, compared to parasites, they're large and they're not usually contaminated with a bunch of human DNA um, and human material. So the, um, you know, we can generate genomes out of just legs of mosquitoes at this point without too much difficulty. So if you have a whole mosquito to work with, it's plenty of DNA there to, to, generate, a, um, to generate data from. Alistair, do you have thoughts on challenges? I mean, there's compliance challenges about moving samples around too, but I don't know if yeah. that's... We, we have a... a um, we can take some comments also from Sarah, but actually, we, Sarah, before that, uh, a quick clarification from you, Mara. Uh, uh, we are lucky that, you know, the malaria gen community has very good protocols on how to do the sampling. 
But one of the challenges that has come up is, you know, people send samples where mosquitoes were collected in batches. You know, you, that thing will happen off tube, you have 20 mosquitoes there, and then they start to separate one and put in each of those uh, wells. Your recommendation is, is not that. So I, I think for, for, for many of us, one thing that our experts can clarify or help us with is how exactly do we handle these samples if they are destined for, uh, for uh, um, genomic sequencing work? Uh, it might look like a basic, sound basic question, but I think it's an important thing for us, especially people who are, you know, either lab scientists or entomologists <laughs> trying to get good data out of molecular, uh, um, out of uh, genomic sequences. So do you guys have any specific recommendations? What are the specific things we must not do or we should do with regard to the blood samples, but also the mosquito samples? And we, you know, we we'll just put up the, the same slides from your own the protocols just for that. And then it would be nice to also hear a little bit from the Broad Institute from Sarah. Go ahead, Mara. So for mosquitoes, I think um, they're fairly robust to collection strategy, but I think there is some major benefits if we collectively come up with a protocol that we're all using. Um, because that kind of standardization means that other questions you might want to ask about the samples that um, that don't come out necessarily of the mosquito DNA, but perhaps of the DNA of other organisms it's carrying become easier to address. So we can detect all sorts of different bacterial species in the DNA of the mosquitoes we sequence, but because they've been collected in all sorts of different ways by different people, we never know if that's contamination or overgrowth or, you know, native, is that native microbiota or is that just random contamination? So I think if we don't have the, the golden, you know, answer of, this is how you get the best quality microbiome because that's not actually been our focus. But I think we know that the microbiome is important for transmission. We know, you know, microsporidia is important, you know. Um, so I think keeping in mind those sorts of additional things you can do with the data. Um, and if we collectively kind of continue to work towards a standardized, standardized protocol and how we collect and what we put the mosquitoes into. So currently we recommend ethanol. Um, I think it's good to try to collect mosquitoes live, not let them sit around too long <laughs> and, and you know, freeze them down or knock them out with cold and get them into ethanol from living, rather than to have them dead in a, in a trap for a very long time and then later, you know, then put into a falcon tube all together and then move them into plates later for, for extraction. But actually sometimes that's good enough for the question you wanna ask. Um, and so again, it really depends, I think, on what, what do you want to do with the data when you get it back? If all you want to do is know about insecticide resistance status across the you know, whole genome, and you're not going to ever be interested in looking at the uh, microbiome, for example, then uh, you know, it's, they could have been all housed together. And as long as you're sure you're not like mixing legs up, you know, you're putting individual mosquitoes in. You don't want to contaminate between mosquitoes, but that's, that's good enough DNA to sequence. Does that help answer your question? Uh, uh, Shela, is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, I think there's Fred. There's Fred, a Ross, Fred, Fred I, can, I, can, I can add on that. Uh, you, you're yeah. referring to me? Okay. I just want to give again another practical example. Before I got in parasites, I tried mosquitoes. And one day, what I, I, over, over the weekend around 2004, 2005, Dr. Andrew Tem, who is on this lecture, and I spent two days in the lab trying to analyze mosquito samples in vain because they were not well collected. So for me, sample collection and storage, everything to do with the preservation, archiving is as critical as anything else. I mean, the most important step in um, uh, uh, genomic surveillance, if we really want to put it. So I would refer to the popular words in computing that garbage in, garbage out. If we don't collect <laughs> samples well, we will end up with troubles, lost effort, lost resources, et cetera, et cetera. So Mara mentioned about ethanol collection, whatever. I think as a community, we need to be developing best practices, including resources to support people who are starting. I, when I was starting, 
the whole process we went through, I wouldn't imagine anyone else going through that. For example, when we started talking about whole genome sequencing in parasites, we had to go through depletion of white blood cells using CF11 columns. And, and if, if, I could, if I had a picture of the setup we made to be able to make sure that the blood is filtered to, make, to get red blood cells and separate with white blood cells, Good enough, we now have the methodologies where we can disentangle parasites from human uh, uh, white, uh, white blood cells contamination. So what I'm trying to say, and I don't, have, I don't want to get into details of how we do it, is for those labs and colleagues who are well established to make sure that we have better resources in terms of SOPs, which we are putting in the public out there for those beginners, or, and particularly the programs, yeah. they don't have time to waste. They, they can't find that time because they're involved in so many things. So if we had SOPs and other resources to share, that would make a world of, of, of difference. And so for us in our project, we're working with the Dauda, and at the moment we have over four SOPs, which will be out in the public for anyone to adopt and use. And we think that would be our initial contribution towards standardized uh, practices in molecular surveillance. Can I just jump in and add, I think all of that is spot on. Standardization is key and not only of collection, but actually of metadata too. Um, uh -huh. because that's where the samples become so valuable. You need to know when you collected them, why you collected them, how you collected them. And um, we, like Deus, we're working hard to try to create um, a kind of standardized metadata collection form for this large scale Amplicom project, which we'd be very happy to share and for other people to use for their own projects. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll work on that. Thank you. Uh, I, there are a number of questions here, and I think this is an interesting point. I would like us to bring in Janet Midega. She, she wants to make a quick comment, and then we proceed. Uh, we would like to uh, share us some several questions on resistance yeah. still. Hi, hi, and Go ahead, uh, Janet. Yeah, hi, Fredos. I just wanted to fill in um, um, the information that the Mara just filled in. Um, so the first one was on whether or not uh, mosquito samples should be stored individually for DNA um, extraction if they were going for whole genome analysis. And I think that's been adequately answered as well, that it's always best to store them individually. And I think in the time I did the field collection, there were some capsules which we were tiny capsules, like the capsules for medicine that we could uh, safely use to put a little silica gel at the bottom and use to store samples with just a really tiny append of tubes. And also I think the, the, um, the metadata, as Mara just um, uh, mentioned, is also very important. The house number, the GPS location, because in tracking um, genomic changes and how variability um, happens across populations, I think the uh, GPS data on location is very, very important. So just that's just a contribution I wanted to make and thanks for organizing this. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, yeah. Fredros, I just wanted to emphasize a few things. Um, and again, I'm gonna focus a lot on the parasite side, but I think as has been said, um, filter yeah. paper collection and the way that, uh, I'll talk a lot about Senegal and again, Dauda and Guy and also the uh, National Malaria Control Program, Fatuba and Medun and Yop who are our colleagues, the, the first thing I would say is that they have worked to develop an integrated surveillance system. So they collect on filter paper that's actually a protein saver card. So you both integrate malaria with other kinds of surveillance in terms of sustainability. From filter paper material, now with selective whole genome amplification and other things, we can do a really good job of getting even whole genome sequence off of filter yeah. paper cards. And the way that Senegal has done this, although there is a Sentinel site system that is a clinic based or health facility based system, they also collect in household structures that they have a, a community based collection. And they've done a lot to do the training so that when an RDT is taken, the remaining blood is put on a filter paper and then all of that is collected together so that you get this integrated constant surveillance um, for both malaria and other questions. So I think one of the things to think about is how we, if we're moving into surveillance mode, what, what we're collecting. So there's both community and also health facility. One of the questions we're trying to answer as are others is, is a health facility as a Sentinel site, uh, what you need to look for transmission, to look for drug resistance monitoring, et cetera. The other thing I would say is that 
Um, with regard to this uh, integrated surveillance system, I think it is something that you don't need that many samples to see these signals. So I think mm -hmm. the idea is that typically with about 100 samples per health facility, we see the rich genetic information, again, with that repeated sampling over time, um, that is quite informative. So I think the other thing to think about in sampling design is the numbers you need for power to discern things. And I think, you know, it depends on your question, but often just a few hundred samples is typically what you're going to be, is giving you the rich signals that you will see. Yeah. Again, with this idea of, of the temporal, and I think has been said, identifying when samples are collected by time and where, geography, space, is really informative along with that rich metadata. So just to emphasize those points. But filter papers for malaria parasite genomics and, and whole genome sequencing get us quite a lot of information. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much uh, uh, to, to all of you for this. We, we, we thought um, that this sample collection aspect which must not be ignored just because we are doing genomics. I think uh, it, it's an area that, I mean, like uh, we can, we're seeing on the chat here, if there are protocols to be shared, and we are grateful to Malaria Jen and colleagues for already sharing those. If there are protocols to be shared, it would be fantastic because then uh, people don't have to spend time on those. Uh, also the issue of integration, you know, you're doing HRP2, you're doing parasite uh, resistance, uh, drug resistance, and many other things. How do you integrate all those? So again, any suggestions of those would be would be great. What we're going to do now uh, on Michelle's advice is we're going to talk about Senegal, and then we're going to talk about capacity building. And uh, uh, those, we still have one or two questions for you from Zanzibar and Dar es Salaam. And then one question for the vectors people, and then I think our time will be gone. So, Shela, shall we start with uh, Senegal? Yes, yes, go ahead, Fred. Okay, okay. So, um, gonna skip all that. Uh, we might come back to those. Forgive us. We have millions of questions for you guys. We'll need a second masterclass. <laughs> I know, def most definitely. Uh, before we do the, the Senegal, we have a lead discussion here. Technical discussion, but important one. So uh, Dan, please help us with this. As transmission intensity decreases, you know, they always try to explain to, to me this a few weeks ago, and I think I've forgotten everything. So as transmission goes down, this the complexity of infection decreases. And you then have the proportion of the so-called monogenic infections increase. And you start to have the clonal parasites appearing in greater proportions. And the other thing is that you can assess this with genetic relatedness measures, and you have two measures here, identity by state and identity by descent. Uh, and then there's the question of in low transmission settings, how do we use this? So again, a lot of technical detail, but it's nice to clarify this before we go into the Senegal situation. So uh, please right. uh, Good. Uh, so, Dan, help us with this. Yeah, yeah in, in some ways, you know, I, I think this is a framework for, for thinking about what happens as you go from very high transmission where, you know, people are carry, you know, have many infective bites uh, in the course of a transmission season. And, and you know, our thinking on this really is based on the work with Dauda NDA and the NMCP in Senegal. So it's, it's seasonal transmission, but over a season, there are regions of Senegal where there's very high incidence in the Southeast and regions in the North where there's very low incidence um, almost approaching uh, elimination. And if you think about it, if someone is receiving multiple mosquito bites over the course of a season, they're likely to be infected with multiple different genomes. But as transmission goes down, either over space or over time with uh, changes in you know, the implementation of anti-malarial measures uh, and anti-vector measures, uh, 
that is going to change. And that's reflected uh, from our data in how many different genomes uh, a person is carrying. So in high transmission areas, we see high complexity of infection. And in regions with very low transmission, uh, you start to see this increase in clonality. And we have parasites, you know, much of this work was done in a, an area close, uh, a, a few uh, 40 kilometers or so from Dakar, uh, an area of ch called CHESS where there's a central clinic and we've been working there for over 20 years. So we have this longitudinal data. And yeah, I think you, I think we can, I think we actually have a slide. If you like, I can put that up. Or, or yeah, or Sarah can go over this, but just yeah, to, to, yeah. to sort of um, talk about this, we see these clonal parasites, the exact same genome, which we originally detected by clonal barcodes, but now have whole genome sequence, has persisted. Uh, a, a surprising result, but we now know that this is a hallmark of this, this relatively low transmission. And so this allows us, and, and Sarah will go into this, I think we've now expanded this uh, at the whole genome level. So not only can you look at clonal parasites, but you can look at parasites that are brothers and sisters or cousins related, highly related, all the way down to parasites that have minimal relatedness. And this is a way to begin to map transmission networks. And we think this is gonna be extremely powerful, particularly as regions move from moderate to low transmission. Tracking this will allow us actually to track um, uh, the changes in transmission, both down and in some cases in rebound. Yeah. Um, and so, so I think this tool um, really allows us to begin to think about how to use genetics, as I said in my earlier remarks, to understand transmission and then to use that in turn to understand impact of various interventions. So I, I don't know if you wanna to go to Sarah um, to talk about yeah. this in some more yeah. detail. I yeah, exactly. And, and also how you use, you've touched on this briefly, but how you can use this to uh, predict the changes in places where you don't, you have not previously collected data, what might have been happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, ahead, so I can, I can elaborate a little bit. Um, but as Diane said, that we're, we're following population signals. And there are sort of a few signals we're looking for, which are related to transmission level in terms of like the numbers of parasites. So this complexity of infection is the term that we use. And then we're looking for the relatedness both within and between sites. So maybe I can give you a concrete example. Um, we know that a lot of these signals, I should say, relate to R0 and relate to transmission using modeling. So we, we do a lot of modeling with the Institute for Disease Modeling as our, as our collaborating partner. Let me just give you a concrete example of the different kinds of genetic patterns we see. The National Malaria Control Program informs a lot of what we do, and they had two sites that had the same epidemiologic level. So incidence was something around 50 per thousand. And these two sites were embedded in a region geographically that had pushed the incidence down to less than one per thousand. So they were interested in why these two sites were so difficult to get low in terms of their incidence. And one of the things that the genetic signals showed us is one of these sites is characterized by an incredibly clonal parasite structure. All the parasites, 77% of them, match another parasite in the community. And looking at the sort of household structure, this suggests that there's a lot of local and focal transmission that's happening in this site. So this might be a place where vector-based interventions, spraying or other things may be amenable to try to address. In contrast, the other site with the same outward prevalence incidence levels had very um, a parasite architecture, the genetic structure that everything was partially related to other things. And in fact, was related to other parts of Senegal. And one of the things we know about that site is it is a place where there's a large religious migration that happens right in the middle of transmission season. So the hypothesis is that this suggests that there's parasites either coming in or going out to this site. 
and in and maybe more imported malaria is contributing to the cases that we see yeah. there. So identifying whether or not based on these genetic signals that the exact same epidemiology prevalence incidence, you see patterns of local and focal transmission, which have maybe more amenable to a vector based intervention versus where you have importation, where case management, identifying your cases, clearing infections, maybe a better strategy has really helped the National Night Control Program in Senegal try to think about how to address these two kind of areas which have been really difficult to push their incidence down. So I think we're using genetics in a real practical way to help them understand, you know, it's, it's more, we say granular information. You get more information about what's happening in terms of the transmission networks um, that you don't necessarily see just by looking at cases or prevalence or incidents. So that's just an example to sort of share. Uh, how related is that to this work that you've done with the barcodes? Yeah, so we can see a lot of these signals with just the barcode. The barcode for us is 24 independent SNPs. And we see a lot of these patterns of relatedness. They inform a lot. Um, we do get more information from whole genome sequence because now we can, what, what the barcode does is tell us what's identical to a, so we can see clones, but we don't necessarily see the partially related parasites that help us understand these transmission networks. And that's where the sequencing data is getting us more information about the partially related uh, infections. Um, yeah. I would say that we, we, you know, you get a lot of information out of the barcode. The barcode is something that's done entirely in Senegal. They can do all of this themselves. It's very sustainable, very easy to do. And it gives you a lot of information. I think if you want to understand all of that sort of partial relatedness and inform more the connectivity among different geographies, the sequence data is getting us more. And we're at the process of transferring this technology to Senegal. So they do their own sequencing um, in, in a broad sense, and we're trying to help them figure out how to do this in a way that's meaningful to their decision-making process in country. Fantastic. Uh, Dan, do you want to add something? No, I think uh, Sarah has, has said it well. I think that, you know, we view the barcode as kind of an entry technology. It was developed many years ago when genome sequencing was prohibitively expensive. Uh, amplicon sequencing, whole genome sequencing have now become much more amenable uh, to, to working. And with the Africa CDC emphasis on having a genomics, a set of genomics networks and capability in Africa, we see this as an evolving technology, um, giving us answers uh, that, and, and important for us, and I, I think important in kind of my vision of this has always been that this needs to be technology, which is done in country yeah. from beginning to end. And you know, Senegal is, is making great progress and there's great integration with the National Malaria Control Program. Um, I think this is an, an example of it can be done, but, but we're clearly still working together to make um, the technology uh, sort of more accessible and the, the use of the data more accessible. And, and I just wanna emphasize that I think this is an area where uh, you know, collaboration and iterative uh, integration between those asking the important questions around epidemiology and, and eventual elimination of malaria need to have this iterative process with those that are technologically enabled because it, it it is something where we don't have all the answers, but we see great potential. And I, I think this is just a fantastic opportunity for yeah, young yeah. scientists who are interested at this interface. I think breakthroughs are gonna be made in, in the next three to four years in Africa yeah. by Africans. Thank you so much uh, on, on that note, Dan. I wanted to ask one, two other questions on, on, on the Senegal situation. There is a village in Senegal that is pretty well characterized called Dielmo. I don't know if you guys ever yep. watched there. Um, this is mostly Institute Pasteur, but we have sampled parasites from Dielmo as, as well. So, um, so this Dielmo situation, I mean, uh, my friend, Dr. Jerry Klein explained this many years ago to me, and he always used this as an example of, 
for one of the best character expressions. And then when we were preparing for the masterclass, we searched and searched and we realized there was no genetic epidemiology of this area. Any information here? So there's a paper by Amy Bay. Um, I can try to find the, the link for you quickly and put it in the chat box, um, where we did sample in collaboration with Institute Pasteur, who has done the year over year sampling. We applied the molecular barcode to look at the genetics across time and saw as they saw transmission declines um, with all of their intervention applications, uh, great differences in the genetic composition and clonal parasites that started to emerge from this parasite population. So we have, we have sampled relatively a few uh, samples from this massive and wonderful collection. Uh, I think it is a testament to the tremendous work of, of sort of this longitudinal sampling. Um, but again, we have sampled a little bit to show that some of those genetic signals, as you might predict, as transmission has gone down, you see the real um, collapse of the genetic um, sort of diversity. Um, yeah. Again, it's, there's fewer and fewer parasites and even the emergence of these clonal lineages that then persist. And so that's something, uh, there is a publication, Amy Bay uh, is one of the key authors, Asatu Torre from Institute Pasteur. And I'll, I'll try to find the, PM, the ID and put it in for you in a moment. Yeah, before you go, and, and at this point, we, we, are, we welcome our other experts as well if they have any questions. Uh, first, really just to say congratulations to our colleagues in Senegal, uh, fantastic work they're doing there, uh, uh, the epidemiology of malaria, and not just on this, but also the work they do on SMC and so on. We are following all this keenly. I do hope that we will get one of them on our masterclass soon. So uh, we, we're trying those strings, hopefully. We'll yeah, well, to, you know, I should so. say, I'm sure Dada would have loved to have been here, but he is yeah. on the WHO mission to China uh, for uh, investigating the potential for a certification of China being malaria free. So he's playing a very important role yeah. in the world for malaria, um, but he obviously is also very important to the Senegal situation. I'm sure he would love to be here. Exactly. That, and there is a related, uh, I, I believe you guys have read this paper and um, um, Deus, you, you probably know this as well. This is a related situation. Same approaches, I believe. Uh, Zanzibar, um, Island, and mainland Tanzania. You know, a question has always been the persistent malaria in Zanzibar, is it coming from mainland? And we had a masterclass with Dave Smith where this question was, we try to answer this question on the basis of people travel, human travel some nice work that had come out of Chai. During the preparation for this masterclass, we come across this work that kind of uses uh, uh, genomics to answer the same question. Interestingly, they arrive at the same answer. It's the Zanzibaris who travel to the mainland who bring the parasite. So in the end, it's exactly the same kind of parasite you have in the mainland uh, uh, to, uh, as you have in the, in the island. Same, same answers, uh, different... Um, strategies. Again, no specific question here, but if you, any one of you has a specific comment on this one, just to stress this point, we would welcome that. Uh, Fred, uh, probably I can start. Go ahead, uh, I, I, just, I just wanted to, uh, I mean, explain something we called because of the uh, training and engagement with engagement activities we have had with yes. the police makers, including uh, regional leaders in our project. And we had to come up with something to be able to tell what would actually mean to a person when you say someone can have multiple clone infections. And I gave an, I, I wrote in the chat, but I, I think it's, it's good to put it here. In Africa, people understand pictures, dances, and those kind of things. And so we came up with a synonym or kind of a, a, an explanation that imagine of, a human body as a room. So in a room, you can have one person. And in our case, that person will be of a single tribe. But you can have a room with multiple people. And um, uh, assuming that that person does, if you have a single person, does, that person is not clonal, like a person with, with I mean, or twins. Uh, if you could give an example of that, so twins of the same tribe in one body, 
and then or people of the same tribe in one body and then in one room and then a room full of with people of different tribes. So that helped us uh, for people to understand that, oh, you can have multiple tribes of the parasites in a single body. So you can have marked clonal and monoclonal infection. So it's getting yeah. exciting as we meet people who have no idea of genetics and genomics, and we need to get the message home. So with respect to Zanzibar, I think the situation is a bit complex. We do know in history that Zanzibar has made, I think this is the third attempt to eliminate malaria. And it seems to be probably not working the way everyone expected. So importation is believed to be one of them. And and and, and in one of in some of the meetings with the program and uh, some colleagues from Zanzibar, I normally tell them that as long as you guys are traveling and you are traveling to Zanzibar will mess up your life because the connection between the mainland and the Zanzibar is so huge. You know, the distance is about, I, I can't remember, 50 kilometers, very short. It's a, it's a short, a short narrow uh, area where people move. And, and even if you wanted to control, we have boats between Zanzibar and the Tanga, between Pemba and the Tanga, between Mombasa and, Tang and, and Pemba. And so importation of parasites from the mainland, part of even Kenya, will still be a, a big problem uh, in Zanzibar. But the good thing is now we have this kind of technology, which we, I think we need to embrace to be able to answer such questions. Where it, it, why are we not able to get to zero in Zanzibar or closer to zero? Uh, this kind of technology is, is giving some answer, urgent, which are urgently needed. And I hope we'll be doing more studies of this in nature with malaria, the malaria elimination program within the, in, in, in the mainland. And as we put up our database, that actually will be in public repository, and they should be able to refer and compare the parasite signatures once they have uh, parasites in, 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 in the island. So it, it's a great initiative. I know the colleagues who were involved, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Giuliano and Jeff, they are actually the same collaborators in, in our current project. So we will be actually able to use the same data and we are trying to make an assembly of all the data we are collecting in Tanzania now and even in the past to be able to, to answer uh, as, as different questions in a, in a temporal way, uh, as we mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Professor Dan is uh, going to leave in 10 minutes, so we, we, we're going to try and bring this to a close. We will ask two quick questions. Uh, 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 Shela, do you want to take the capacity building one first and then uh, we do the HRP2? Or we do the HRP2 first? Let's Can try the HRP2 first. Yeah. Uh, very general question. Um, HRP2 deletions. How much of a concern is this in Africa? And generally in very general terms, and what should the plan be? Deus mentioned earlier that there are already good protocols for this. Um, as as we, we move towards elimination, places like Zanzibar, how much effort should we be putting on, on, um, on monitoring for the HRP2 deletions? Right. Uh, friend of this is Diane. As you know, at the Malaria Policy Advisory Group meeting uh, in April, um, this issue uh, was on the agenda. And um, I think we all recognize that in certain regions, particularly in um, the Horn of Africa, uh, this is a significant problem and is likely compromising uh, the ability to accurately diagnose and and prevent serious disease and uh, including death. And so uh, we uh, have flagged this uh, as the um, senior uh, malaria policy uh, advisory group at WHO for the director general as a major issue that countries need to be aware uh, of the potential of HRP23 deletions. These deletions were first reported in South America now uh, decades ago before RDTs actually were in common use. So we don't know why uh, 
HRP23 deletions are appearing uh, and perhaps increasing. But again, this, this is a, a, a real practical problem from a diagnostic standpoint. And it speaks to this issue we were speaking about earlier of the need for surveillance. And, and I think it's important. There is uh, an established uh, WHO uh, GMP protocol for this. Dr. Jane Cunningham is the point person at WHO. There are WHO reports on this. And I refer anyone who's interested in the details um, to uh, the background material and uh, the minutes would, that will soon be posted uh, for the um, April uh, MPAG meeting. Um, what I would say also is that in, in thinking about this with national malaria control programs, I yeah, think no. it is important um, to uh, make sure the sampling and study design, as, as Deus was saying, is appropriate to detect our, our potential RDT negatives at some frequency. So it's, it's a major problem in the Horn of Africa we, we actually, uh, and there are reports elsewhere. So I think everyone needs to be on board and speaking to one of the themes of this, um, using standard SOPs for detection is also going to be important. And, uh, and there are methodologies, none of the methodologies are perfect or particularly convenient. Um, uh, US CDC, uh, has you know probably one of the best methodologies, but I, I think there's room for improvement here. So there's also some room for research, but it's an important problem and one which really uh, only some form of molecular diagnostics, genetic epidemiology, or conceivably um, serological applications can actually help uh, define. Uh, so with that, I would say, yes, we should keep our eyes open. Thank you. Thank you. Fred, yeah. Fred, can I add something? Uh, yeah. Dara has said it. Dara has said it all. Uh, they need not to wait until when the situation gets worse. So, one thing I've been challenged by the program in Tanzania as we got started is, in case you detect the deletion, do you have a, another method you can use for malaria diagnosis? My answer is. Probably we don't at the moment. What we have is not the best we should have. And they said, why shouldn't you start making one so that when you detect the deletion, you also have one in stock? I, I don't know how to approach it, but I think it's something we should be working on together. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. think there are definitely research opportunities here, but, but I, I think there is a standard protocol which people should use because we should be getting this data sooner rather than later. I wouldn't wait for the perfect assay, I would move ahead um, with current methodologies. Thank you. Because we still have a bit of your 10, ten minutes, there's something you mentioned earlier on when you started at, uh, about the, the arrival or the emergence of K-13 in Africa, de novo. Uh, this is a, uh, from Sangha Institute, a summary of the uh, genetic epidemiology of uh, malaria artemisinin and resistance. They talk quite a bit about what is happening in Africa. The uh, text we've highlighted in yellow uh, uh, suggests that K13 is not undergoing any strong selection. Uh, but I do know also from Deus's work uh, recently that you start to see a lot of uh, um, uh, cases emerging in the East Africa region and in the, in, uh, in, in the, in the East Africa region in particular. Uh, about this, so any uh, any updates that uh, our colleagues on the on the line might might want to have, and again, this can be from any of our partners also from yeah. Clara, from Mara. Yeah, th this is Diane again. It 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 also came up at the impact meeting. Um, there is a, both the issue which is published and everyone is aware of in Rwanda, but uh, a more recent emergence. Uh, of, of a K13 mutation that seems to be growing in the population in Uganda. Again, I think you know, one needs to take these uh, observations and put them in context. There's still no failures, but uh, there is 
evidence in limited TES studies for reduced clearance time, which is the hallmark of artemisinin resistance, but as yet uh, no confirmed failures of, um, of treatment of ACT combination therapy treatment. But I think it again speaks, and this is a situation where we will have baseline data before resistance emerges. So again, critical to have this baseline data, but we are seeing de novo mutation. The WHO um, convened now two and a half years ago or so, a discussion about whether or not the risk of importation of artemisinin resistance from the GMS, from the Greater Mekong subregion, was going to be a risk in Africa. And the expert committee that reviewed that suggested that while that was a potential, uh, there was also the potential for independent emergence of artemisinin resistance in continental Africa. And so far, the data that is available for emergence of these mutations indicates they are occurring on a background of African parasites. And therefore, importation has yet to be um, sort of confirmed and uh, may not be a, a, a very large factor. But again, I think surveillance over time will tell us the answer to this. And again, something very important to keep watch because it has very practical application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last question, Shayla, please. Yes, thank you, Fred. So Diane, why will, why will we'll still have you on the line? Um, so during your career, have you had any mentors and uh, what's the most useful help you've gotten from your mentors? Well, you know, I've had lots of mentors. I've been very fortunate. Um, and I, I think the, the best thing mentors told me is, is never be afraid to try something. Um, you know, I, I think Deus was saying, you know, people thought that, uh, you know, when he tried, suggested whole genome sequencing or genetic analysis of malaria back in the early 2000s, everyone thought it was impossible. So I, I think it's important um, for people to take risks and to explore kind of the edges of their knowledge. The other thing that, that I will say is, you know, I trained as a very basic scientist coming from Massachusetts Institute of Technology Biology Department. And then I trained at uh, the Harvard Biolabs with Wally Gilbert, one of the Nobel Prize winners for DNA sequencing. These were, my work was very fundamental molecular biology. Since moving to the School of Public Health, I've had really tremendous mentors in my colleagues of bringing, uh, bringing together the importance of the public health impact of basic science discoveries. And I think that's something which those of you working in an African setting also have the, the experience of really looking through the lens of how can I take my fundamental discoveries and use those to have an impact on something like malaria transmission or malaria disease. Thank you very much, Diane. Um, and, and this is a question to all uh, our other panelists. Um, what would you like to add on today? Um, maybe we can start with you, Dios. Um, anything, any take home message for us today? Uh, thank, thank you so much. A very, <clears throat> very enlightened discussion. I just wanted to echo what Diana said in, 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 and to register our unfortunate situation. For, for, for example, my case, I, I started off with malaria back in the early 2000s, and I never had a strong mentorship around me. So the personal struggle, orphanage situation, and quite often getting disappointed. Like whenever you start talking about anything and no one has a chance to listen to you. Imagine me of the situation Diana mentioned, working in a, in a lab of Gilbert who won a, a Nobel Prize, a Nobel Prize and, and moving up her later, you, you can imagine and compare and contrast our situation where someone has to work for five or more years to get his or her first paper in malaria journal. Unlike the person in that situation who might have a paper in nature in the next 
for two to three years. So basically, we have been in a very disadvantaged situation, and we are lucky that we are at least making our ways out. And my wish would be not this to happen to the young generation. So that's why we are investing heavily in training and mentorship. And something uh, Janet mentioned, we are finding it very hard to get universities where we can register our students. And even when we get the students registered, they can't get supervised. Can you imagine having a thesis of a student which the supervisor has never read? Have you seen that? That is happening. And, and this situation we don't want young colleagues uh, going through. We went through that and we should probably be the last generation to get into that kind of struggling. So uh, my journey has been that kind of madness, but I, I would want to uh, dedicate the remaining time of my career to helping out all those who are struggling not to be able to go through what we went through. Thank you, Dales. Um, and to you, Alistair, any final thoughts? Uh, well, just to say that it's been a huge pleasure, of course, to be a part of this and to have been able to drop into some of the other masterclasses as well. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's so many things that we could have spoken about that we haven't had the opportunity to speak about. So, you know, I really, really hope that we uh, get the chance to kind of dig in a bit more deeply to some of the issues that we've just, you know, touched on and really kind of ask some difficult questions about how both we can develop the capability to do uh, malaria vector genomics at surveillance scale, which I think is, you know, quite a different um, uh, type of activity from, from, uh, from you know, research, research work, but uh, also how we can, you know, uh, really kind of test all of those ideas about how that connects with all of the challenges that we're facing around you know, which control tools to use in which locations, which, which tools are most effective, you know, how, how, what are the decisions that are being made, how can you influence them, are things being done in a timely way, you know, really, really testing all these ideas about how genomics could, could add value and testing our assumptions and, and trying to figure out where all, all, all of the challenges and all, all of the uh, obstacles are. So, so yeah, I really look forward to hopefully doing that in the future. And, and thanks again. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Alistair. Um, and to you, Dr. Sarah, as well, anything to add on? Yeah, so um, I thank everyone. This has been a really exciting um, format, and I agree that there's so many uh, additional conversations to be had. I think I would echo what Diane said about never be afraid. And I think sometimes genetics and genomics can be a little intimidating, especially for uh, field scientists and even molecular biologists who focus on the biology of parasites and vectors. And I think that in, you know, instead of being afraid of what it means, I think they're building this sort of understanding and, and asking questions and learning from different perspectives um, is really, really important. So I would encourage everyone to you know, keep being curious and not be afraid of what I term geek speak, you know, when you have sort of this genetic like and genomic, yeah, like SNP, what is that? Um, people talk <laughs> in jargon, as one of my uh, friends said, they talk in jargon when they don't know what they're talking about. So um, I think it's, it's really important that we keep the conversation in, in multiple directions, because as much as, as someone may be a genetic or genomics expert, they're also you know, other people are the expert in the vector biology or the parasite biology. And we need to remember that it's the back and forth and that dialogue that's really going to enrich the science for everyone. So to not be afraid to ask questions, to be curious. Um, and I think that is what I would encourage. And I really, again, appreciate this masterclass forum. I think it's a wonderful, I've learned a lot being on several, listening to several of them and hope to in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Dr. Mara? I know thoughts. Um, on, I think I was trying to reflect on uh, success criteria a little bit in terms of job satisfaction and thinking about that as good mentorship guidance that I've had in the past around, um, you know, I had a whole two year postdoc that felt like a failed endeavor because actually I worked really hard, but nothing came of it. No, pa no papers, no real findings. Um, and uh, and I left science for a year, really kind of thinking that I was done with it. 
And actually what brought me back was, was kind of really thinking about, okay, if that happens again to me, <laughs> if I invest years of my life again in another project and feel like personally it's failed, um, how can I make sure that more widely it hasn't failed? And that is what actually brought me into malaria. Leaving, I mean, I still am really loving evolutionary genetics and that's how I got here because that's my background. But I used to work in kind of arcane sexual conflict in Drosophila where it was super intellectually interesting but didn't feel like it had any real world implications. And so I think investigating in your own self what, what, is, what will bring you the satisfaction and through those years of hard work that may not lead anywhere that you really can see in the moment um, and I think malaria, working in, malaria, in this field is incredible because A, you have so many, um, you know, there's so much room for impact. There's st it's still such a massive problem and it really shouldn't be. And, um, and B, there's great colleagues <laughs> everywhere. And, um, and also there's that sort of fundamental undercurrent, sort of no matter what you're doing, you're contributing to something that's an important problem in the world. So I think that that's um, kind of investigating what brings you long-term uh, sort of satisfaction is a good thing to do for, and, and that's good mentorship advice I've had in the past. Thank you very much, Dr. Mara. Back to you, Fred. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shayla. Uh, thank you um, to all our speakers. Thank you, Diane. Thanks, Mara. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, Deus. Thanks, Janet, for joining briefly. And uh, thanks, Charles, for volunteer as well. And thanks to everybody else who joined. Uh, this was a great uh, session. I enjoyed it a lot myself. I uh, believe that each one of you guys enjoyed it. Uh, Shell and myself will try to uh, keep this format going. But as you can see, some of the, the subjects are not within our own uh, forte. So uh, we might be struggling with certain technical details. But please forgive Shell and myself. And, and just just help us learn through this. Uh, uh, we found this uh, very useful for the young uh, um, scientists who attend every week, but also for uh, other experts, especially those working at the National Malaria Control Programs and other malaria advocates. Our next master class comes next week, where we'll be uh, uh, delving a lot, combining experiences from Asia, Southeast Asia. And Africa, they have uh, much less malaria there. They have had a lot of experiences going towards elimination. We will be taking a lot of lessons there. Uh, so we will, we will send out an invitation in case you have time. Feel free to send this to your colleagues as well who might want to attend. And hopefully we can continue the masterclass series in the month of July as well. This was being streamed live. It's available on our a YouTube channel, so feel free to access it at your own time. We are grateful for the number of participants we had today. At, at maximum, there was 200 of, uh, 201 of us who attended, but I can see that even three hours later, there's still more than 50% uh, people attending. So uh, we, we assume therefore that the interest is real. And uh, thank you guys so much. We're gonna end here. And once again, I just wanna say a big thank you to all the experts big thank you to all the participants and a big, big, big thank you to Dr. Sheila Ogoma, my co-host here. Uh, and we hope to see you again next week when we have our next masterclass. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks for running this, Fredris and Sheila. It was really enjoyable. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.